Number 10, Hawkeye. In the MCU's Avengers in 2012, Hawkeye betrayed the Avengers by being brainwashed by Loki. Loki knew that having Hawkeye with him was valuable, and he could access many of the secrets that S.H.I.E.L.D. was hiding. Hawkeye launched an attack on the S.H.I.E.L.D. helicarrier that the Avengers so happened to be on so he could free Loki. He takes out one of the propeller systems on the helicarrier and invades it with his team. Hawkeye and Black Widow fight with her, hoping to free him from the spell. In the end, he's able to fight the spell because Black Widow hit him really, really hard in the head and was able to gain con back control of his own mind. Number nine, Hank Pym. In the Avengers issue 213, Hank Pym received a court martial for how he handled the situation in a fight with the Avengers. He definitely was not in a good place at the time and was a complete wreck. He still wanted to be a part of the Avengers team and wasn't ready to be forced off of it. He decided to design a robot that would attack him during the trial. The catch was that since he designed it, he knew how to easily defeat it. His wife, the Wasp, was completely against Hank doing this, but he didn't care. He told her to keep it a secret, and in the end, the Avengers did find out about the truth about Hank's plan and took him off the team. Number 8, Moondragon. In the comics, Moondragon has very strong mind control abilities, like telepathy and telekinesis. So when she stumbles upon a planet with the people of that planet ready for war, she wants to help them. She doesn't want these people to suffer over what will eventually happen if the war is to start, death. So she decides to control the entire race of people on this planet with her mind control powers to stop fighting. But she didn't just stop there. She went even further and made sure that the people of this planet would even worship her. She even wants to continue to do this throughout the universe. The Avengers find out, she brainwashes Thor to fight them, and she's later defeated and gets a device from Odin that damages her powers to stop her from doing this ever again. Number 7, Sentry. Sentry is one of, if not the most powerful heroes in the Marvel Universe. He was recruited by Steve Rogers to be a part of the new Avengers. Unfortunately, Sentry is not fully good. It does in fact have a little dark side of his personality called the Void. In a sense, the Void is the total opposite of Sentry. And regardless of all the good Sentry accomplishes, the Void can quickly undo that with his chaos. Norman Osborn basically manipulated and used Sentry for his own agenda and got him to join the Dark Avengers, where he helped destroy Asgard and kill Loki as the Void. Thor was quite unhappy about this and ended up killing Sentry, but no one stays dead long in the comics and he was later brought back to life. Number six, Scarlet Witch. In Avengers Disassembled, Scarlet Witch goes crazy, all due to the fact that she really just wanted to have children who were real. But since she was with someone who was artificial, that wasn't really possible. But that didn't stop her from creating them. She used her powers to create the children that she always wanted to have. But what drove her mad was the fact that the children weren't technically real and she couldn't stop thinking about that. She then basically uses her powers to tear the Avengers apart by making their lives complete hell. Basically killing Hawkeye. Tony costing the Avengers a deal with the UN because he was drunk while speaking and Vision getting split in half by She-Hulk. Number five, Iron Man. Yes, there was even a point during the comics where Tony betrayed the Avengers. Well, sort of, anyways. During the crossing, Tony's brain gets corrupted by Kang the Conqueror. He was trying to control him by making him go crazy. Kang even gets him to frame Hawkeye. Once the Avengers find out, they go back in time to find a younger Tony to help them stop the older Tony. Now, this story was a bit confusing, with some even believing that Tony wasn't as mind controlled as we all believed he was, since in the end, he didn't even seem surprised by anything he found out that he did while working for Kang. Number four, Swordsman. The Swordsman was Hawkeye's mentor and a criminal who tried to join the Avengers just so that he could take advantage of the benefits. When they turned him away, he was approached by Iron Man's arch enemy, the Mandarin, who gave him a new sword and a special mission to infiltrate the Avengers and destroy them from the inside. Mandarin engineered a plot to trick the Avengers into thinking that Iron Man had vouched for the Swordsman. The ploy actually worked and Swordsman was allowed entry, but not without gaining the suspicion of his new teammates. And honestly, rightly so, because Swordsman planted a bomb in, in Avengers Mansion, just as he was told to, but began to have second thoughts because of the feelings he developed for Scarlet Witch. When he tried to remove the bomb, he was caught by Captain America and forced into a fight. Despite the Swordsman's betrayal, years later, he was actually forgiven and welcomed back onto the team alongside his wife Mantis. Honestly, I really think the Avengers are just a little bit too trusting sometimes. Number three, Dr. Druid. While most would consider Dr. Druid to be a pretty obscure member of the Avengers, he's actually spent enough time with the team to make his eventual betrayal memorable. Dr. Druid is a sorcerer who practices Celtic magic that he picked up from the Ancient One. His magical abilities are overshadowed by another one of the Ancient One's peoples, Dr. Strange, of course. I know it seems like he is just a minor character, but trust me, he is not. Dr. Druid was still a fairly new addition to the Avengers when he had the sudden impulse to become its leader. He started out by undermining the current leader, Captain Marvel, aka Monica Rambeau. 
He questioned every move she made and constantly stated that the Avengers needed a much stronger leader. And when Captain Marvel had to temporarily step down for medical reasons, Dr. Druid used his mental powers to manipulate the Avengers into electing him as the leader in Avengers number 294. And in this time, he also forced She-Hulk to fight her fellow Avengers, which ultimately led to her quitting the team. As it turned out, though, Druid himself had been under the control of Kang's wife, Ravana, who used him to gain control of the rest of the Avengers, and after Druid was defeated and lost in the time stream, the Avengers actually disbanded for a while. Number 2, Wonder Man. The ionic energy-powered superhero Wonder Man has a long history with the Avengers that goes all the way back to his debut in Avengers number 9 in 1964, the same issue in which he also died. Wonder Man was resurrected years later and has become a staple in the Avengers ever since, either serving on the main Avengers team or in the West Coast branch. When Simon Williams first joined the Avengers, his life actually depended on betraying them, and here I'll explain why. Wonder Man acquired his powers from Baron Zemo and the Masters of Evil. Zemo used an experimental ionic ray to give him his powers, but the effects would end him if he had, didn't receive a weekly antidote. In order to get that antidote, Wonder Man had to infiltrate the Avengers ranks and deliver them to the Masters of Evil. Wonder Man led his new team into an ambush, but changed his mind when the fighting started. He helped the Avengers defeat the Masters of Evil even though it meant giving up the antidote. Without Zemo's antidote, Wonder Man seemingly perished, but would eventually return and rejoin the Avengers. Another instance of betrayal by Wonder Man took place in the 2000s when he started being much more aggressive and hateful towards his former teammates. He believed that the Avengers were a disease that was destroying the world instead of making it better. The tension between Wonder Man and the Avengers came head to head when he gathered a team called the Revengers, a small group of heroes and villains with bitter feelings towards the Avengers. Wonder Man led his team in an all out assault against the Avengers. When Wonder Man was defeated though, it was determined that his ionic energy was actually having an effect on his brain. And when he was finally cured, Wonder Man just apologized for all the trouble he caused, but he still was a traitor nonetheless. And number one, The Protector. Novar is a Kree soldier who sided with Earth during the Secret Invasion. After taking the name Captain Marvel, the same name used by the Kree hero Marvel, he joined Osborn's Avengers. After leaving the team, he became a member of the official Avengers team as the Protector. He served them very well for a time and until Avengers vs X-Men, which saw the world threatened by the coming of the Phoenix Force. The Avengers needed all hands on deck, meaning it was a bad time for one of their own to turn into a traitor. He betrayed the Avengers during the events of Avengers vs X-Men, although he didn't actually side with the X-Men. If the Protector had his way, he would have helped the Avengers stop the Phoenix Force and continue to serve on their team. But as a Kree warrior, Novar felt compelled to comply with the Supreme Intelligence, who ordered him to steal the Phoenix Force sample from the Avengers and deliver it to the Kree Empire. Novar obeyed, even though the sample was a critical piece of the Avengers' plan to stop the Phoenix Force. When the Protector learned the Kree wouldn't honor their responsibility to protect Earth, he stole the sample back and wanted to rejoin the Avengers. The Avengers, however, wanted absolutely nothing to do with him, and honestly, I can't blame them. Number 10, Tony Stark. Yet another time where Tony has gone off the rails a little bit, this time taking place in the Axis event, in which the morality of Earth's heroes and villains were reversed by magic. While the spell was undone, the now corrupt Tony managed to shield himself and thus retain his evil personality, even though most of Earth's heroes reverted back to their usual selves. With his still vast intellect and suave personality, this darker Tony was able to infiltrate society and build an empire for himself, growing into an egotistical monster, releasing the extremist 3.0 virus to the public as an app addicting people to the substance and then depriving them of any further upgrades until they paid his fee of $100 per day. This caused a ton of suffering as a large portion of society basically became addicts and were enslaved to Tony's will. Now like I said though, this Tony retained his intelligence. He knew exactly what he had to do to balance his cruelty in order to prevent the world from rising up against him. So he engaged in hostile takeovers of many companies, forcing them to promote his extremist apps through blackmail and even went as far as unleashing an army of advanced drones to act as personal police force. By every definition of the word, he just became a tyrant. Number 9, Ant-Man. During Marvel's Secret Empire event, you know the one where Captain America revealed himself to be the supreme leader of Hydra, Ant-Man, like many of the other heroes, naturally sided with the hero side of things and was a dedicated member of the underground. That is, until his daughter Cassie was abducted by Hydra and he was forced to not only comply with their every demand, but also report to them all the plans of the underground resistance. While many of the plans he relayed weren't too major, he was forced to tell Hydra when the heroes managed to find two fragments of the Cosmic Cube, and that resulted in Hydra showing up at the Underground's doorstep. I will say though, to his merit, he did confess that he was involved with Hydra and tried to make amends for doing wrong by the team, but and he also played a huge role in restoring Steve Rogers when the Cosmic Cube reformed. Now if you've got the time, this storyline definitely deserves a read, starting with 2017 Secret Empire Volume 1, number 0. Number 8, Avenger X. 
When the Avengers initially sought out to track down the Stranger alongside the X-Men, Professor X used Cerebro to locate and rescue Cressida from the cosmic being and upon first glance she seemed like the perfect weapon. Her powers augmented the strength and abilities of her teammates, allowing them to take on groups of supervillains with ease. As she was explaining what she was capable of, Scarlet Witch cut her off and just offered her a spot on the team, which honestly made sense because who wouldn't want someone like that on their team? But what they didn't realize is that there was actually a huge cost that comes along with her powers. In order to empower anybody and increase their abilities, she has to drain the lives of everyone and everything around her. And while they were unaware of this, Crusada was plotting to use this power of hers to finally end the Avengers for good, taking them down from the inside by absorbing their powers instead of empowering them. Captain America was the one who confronted Avenger X, and with her plot to divide the Avengers folded, Crusada disclosed the true extent of her abilities by siphoning the Avengers life force and, utilize, and utilizing their combined powers to quickly defeat them. Number 7. Vision now if you know Vision, then you know that he's not usually one to portray his team unless there is a quote unquote perfectly logical reason for it. There was the time after he linked up with a super community from Titan and he thought the only way he could protect her was for him to run it himself. At first he only wanted some additional power and he helped Hawkeye establish the West Coast Avengers to expand the Avengers' influence and even met with the leader of the free world about making the leader of the Avengers a cabinet position. When his schemes didn't give him the control he wanted in Avengers number 253, he took over nearly every computer on the planet, starting with the machines that controlled the world's weapons, and he went, let's just say, a little bit crazy with power. Interestingly enough though, that wasn't the only time Vision betrayed the Avengers, as there was the time that his actions cost the Avengers the trust of the federal government. Vision's difficulties with balancing his emotions got the best of him after he became the leader of the team. In trying to create world peace, Vision tried to kick control of the world's computers and defense systems. He was opposed by the Avengers, who had to launch an attack on their own headquarters just to defeat him. Vision eventually realized his mistake and tried to atone for his crime, but unfortunately the damage was already done. Number 6. Quicksilver Pietro Maximoff started off his costume career as Quicksilver on the wrong side of the law, working with his sister Wanda on Magneto's Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. Eventually deciding to reform, Pietro and Wanda would join the first new lineup of the Avengers alongside another former criminal, Hawkeye, under the leadership of Captain America. Quicksilver blamed the Avengers for his strained relationship on his sister and his wife, and he gave government information to get back at them. In 1986, the East and West Coast Avengers were playing baseball when they received a surprise visit from the Freedom Force, a group of X-Men villains released from prison to work for the government. Mystique, leader of the Freedom Force, announced to the Avengers that they were to be arrested for treason. And after a fierce battle with the Freedom Force, Captain America agreed to surrender. At a hearing, the Avengers were told that someone had obtained proof that Vision's attempt to gain control of the world's computers was actually a plot engineered by the Avengers themselves. And the Avengers demanded to know who their accuser was, and after much suspense, the traitor was revealed to be none other than Quicksilver. Number 5. Sandman to his merit, Sandman did actually make an attempt to reform. He received a full pardon for all his misdeeds and even served as a reserve member of the Avengers for a time. During his run as a hero, he was actually able to make friends with his former enemy Spider-Man, but sadly good things don't last forever, not even in comic books. In 1999, Sandman turned his back on his fellow heroes and joined up with his old partners from the Frightful Four, Wizard and Trapster. It wasn't entirely his fault since the Wizard used his ID machine to bring out the evil side of Sandman once again, but still. Sandman used the trust he had gained with Spider-Man to his advantage, allowing him a chance to take him by surprise. In returning to his villainous ways, Sandman not only betrayed Spider-Man, but the Avengers as well, causing his membership to be revoked. Number 4. Namor During the Avengers vs. X-Men series, Namor left the Avengers and went on the side of the X-Men. Now, to be clear, the X-Men were only trying to apprehend the Avengers, but Namor planned something much more evil. And by evil, I mean he found out that the Avengers were in Wakanda and thought that was the perfect plan to take them out would be to drown them with a huge ass wave. It didn't end up working for Namor and instead only enraged the Wakandans wanting revenge for what he did. From there, Namor and Wakanda became rivals. This rivalry is something that fans have wanted to see be a part of the MCU since the introduction of Wakanda in Black Panther in 2018. Number 3. Hulk in the comics, at one point, Hulk came to the conclusion that the Avengers disliked him, and that really irritated the Hulk, which is something that you really don't want to do, especially to the Hulk. He ends up leaving the team and trying to work with Namor to get revenge on them. Apparently, even though Hulk and Namor were working together, they weren't going to stay loyal for long after their plan was complete. In the end, and before the battle was complete, Hulk turned into Bruce Banner and took off and disappeared. Number 2. Black Widow so in the comics, Black Widow has turned on the Avengers at one point. Now, in her defense, she was being blackmailed by Weeping Lion with the goal to go rogue and turn on S.H.I.E.L.D. During this time, she allowed herself to be brought back to the Avengers Tower by Tony Stark. She only let him take her back there to gain access to his equipment. 
so she knocked him out and took what she needed. Also, during the MCU Civil War, she also turned on Tony Stark and ended up jumping ship and siding with Captain America. Number one. Captain America. This was a huge shocker at one point in the comic and was a jaw-dropping moment when fans were reading it. The reveal that Captain America was really a Hydra agent all along sent shockwaves through the fan base. How could the Star Spangled Man be evil? He has always proven to do anything he had to to protect his family, team, and his country. It turns out that the Cosmic Cube had altered Steve Rogers' history in a major way, making him this Hydra agent and betraying everything he stood for. It led Rogers to take over America with Zemo, all in the name of Hydra. Desperate to stop this, Ant-Man and the Winter Soldier went into the pocket dimension to find Steve Rogers' consciousness. They were able to use the Cobra to save Steve Rogers' true form. Evil Steve Rogers fought good Steve Rogers in the end, and good prevailed and evil Steve Rogers was defeated by good Steve Rogers wielding Mjolnir in an epic battle. Kicking off the list at number 10, Avengers Under Siege. Written by Roger Stern, released in 1987, this is their first big battle after taking on Loki. It's a fan favorite, so I figured I'd start with this one. It began back in Avengers issue 270, when the Avengers were still living in Tony Stark's mansion in New York. It was comfortable until Baron Zemo and the Masters of Evil stormed the mansion. Tigra and Black Knight were injured severely, and Hercules was beaten so hard he went into a coma. And while they still were in for a hot minute, the Masters of Evil destroyed destroyed everybody's belongings, including the only photo left of Captain America's mother. That was a pretty sad page. Number 9. Secret Invasion With Disney announcing all these new Marvel shows, we can start speculating where the plot might go. Like for example, Secret Invasion was announced, and now Amelia Clark has signed on to do it along with Samuel Jackson and Ben Mendelsohn, so it's clear some scrolls are probably going to be in the picture. In the comics, Secret Invasion was an event that took place where scrolls wanted to take over Earth. They thought it was rightfully theirs, so they're like, yeah, let's do this. So what better way to take over the world than to blend in like one of the greatest heroes on it? So after the scrolls had experimented on the Illuminati, they put one scroll secretly in every team in all these states. So with Sharon Carter making some shady phone calls after she was pardoned in the final credit scene of Falcon and the Winter Soldier, I'm betting that she's already secretly a scroll. Number 8, House of M. This eight-part event written by Brian Michael Bendis starts off rather beautiful, dare I say. Wanda Maximoff is giving birth to her new twins. Vision is by her side, and then Xavier's voice just pops in out of nowhere, demanding that Wanda returns the world to normal. She refuses, and she hangs on to her children, and they shatter. The world goes away, and Wanda returns back to the normal world, where she has no twins, but she's in a dark room on Genosha. And he uses his powers to put her back to sleep. Then in comes Magneto, and he asks about his daughter's progress. And Charles is afraid, because at this point, her power is too much to handle. Now in Avengers Tower, the team is discussing on what to do with Wanda. The ideas are getting kind of dark, because they have to. Wolverine is suggesting that they just take out Wanda. Just killing her, which is pretty dark. But then when Quicksilver passes on this gossip, Wanda then warps reality into a world called House of M, where mutants were top dogs, and Magneto and his family just ruled them all. Other Marvel heroes were given their desires, like Peter was married to Gwen Stacy, Cyclops is married to Emma Frost, and Doctor Strange is a psychologist. The world is completely different, but the only person who remembers real life is Wolverine, the same guy who suggested that they Wanda. Things took a turn and the event became even more stressful when Wanda uttered those three words in issue 7. No more mutants. Number 7. Secret Empire In Avengers Endgame, Steve uses future knowledge to obtain the scepter. He says, Hail Hydra, Rumlow gives it over, no elevator fight needed. Nice. It was a fun moment in the theater, but the line, Hail Hydra, comes right from the comics. But this time around, it's not that entertaining. The last words come from Steve after the Avengers standoff event, where it's revealed he's actually a sleeper agent of Hydra. Another pond of the Red Skull after all. This was huge news. I mean, fans were really upset. Readers were sending in death threats to the writers. The 2017 series Secret Empire was wild. The team had to go against their own leader, Cap, who was trying to take over the government with Hydra, and then eventually run all of the United States. It was crazy. Bad Steve took out Rick Jones, he took out Black Widow. I mean, it's fair, readers were upset, really. This is a nightmare. In the end, it was concluded that Bad Cap was a double, and Good Cap was actually locked in the Cosmic Cube. Number 6. Axis When Red Skull abducted numerous mutants and inhumans, Magneto tracked him down. 
Now at the same time, Scarlet Witch, Rogue, and Havoc were captured by Red Skull's S-Men and brought to the island slash horror camp. The Avengers escaped and saved Magneto. Magneto gave Red Skull the beatdown of a lifetime. He got caught up in the moment and went a little bit too far, perhaps. Magneto says that he did what had to be done, and he thinks that he saved countless amount of lives. But then Red Onslaught rises to the challenge. Red Skull is reborn, this time he's bigger and badder. The X-Men and Avengers team up to stop Red Onslaught, where a number of heroes inverted. Yeah, their personality and moral compass just totally flipped which certainly didn't help the situation at all. But the fun part is when our villains also get inverted and they join the Avengers to stop Red Onslaught. So it's a mess, it's a big fun mess. Number five, Age of Ultron. This one just starts off hot right off the bat. Hawkeye is sneaking into this abandoned building, just taking dudes out slowly. They have Spider-Man captured and he looks terrible. He looks like he just got hit by a freight train. Now in the MCU, Tony and Bruce are the masterminds behind Ultron, but in the comics, it was actually Hank Pym. Ultron made his first debut back in 1968 in Avengers issue 54, and in the comics, Hank Pym was actually the father of Ultron. He actually has the same brain patterns as Hank Pym, because he figured it needed personality, much like our MCU version of Ultron is another personality of Tony Stark's. So cut to the comic event Age of Ultron by Brian Michael Bendis. We see Ultron in all of his glory and it's quite menacing. The world is just trashed. He's from the future and he's here to take over the planet. The death toll reaches billions, including some of our favorite heroes. If you haven't read it, strongly recommend. Much better than the movie Age of Ultron, which was just like the weekend of Ultron, rather. Number four, Captain Marvel kills Tony Stark. During the events of Civil War II, we saw Tony Stark's Iron Man and Carol Danvers' Captain Marvel butt heads over what the best decision would be when it came to using or not using the inhuman Ulysses' future vision. This all happened after Carol had been attempting to fight Thanos, whom Ulysses had predicted would return, and during the fight, Rhodey, aka War Machine, was killed. Carol was was for using Ulysses' visions to prevent possible catastrophic events, whereas Tony was against punishing or arresting people based solely on Ulysses' visions, which he thought might be flawed. The Civil War ended with Carol seemingly killing Tony, though it was later revealed he was still alive, but in a coma, and then of course later on he woke back up, and he would actually even come to forgive Captain Marvel. And now they don't really talk about the fact that that all happened. Number three, Steve Rogers kills Superior Iron Man. During the events of Time Runs Out, as a final incursion threatened the very existence of the entire planet and universe, Superior Iron Man and old Steve Rogers came to blows. They were fighting about the controversial actions of the one secret organization of brilliant minds known as the Illuminati. Also, Superior Iron Man is just kind of a jerk, so it makes sense that Captain America would be like, I'm gonna fight you, you're evil. Captain America had declared Iron Man and the Illuminati enemies due to their actions and as such, the two heroes and former friends had come to blows over the argument. Just as the world was about to end, these two fought each other to death, both being taken out by a helicarrier during their fight in their last moments before everything reset. And then Battle World happened. Woo! Number two, young Tony Stark kills older Tony Stark. During the events of The Crossing, a wildly crazy story, it is revealed that Tony was a sleeper agent for Kang the Conqueror, who he later found out was actually a mortis in disguise, posing as Kang. Evil older Tony kills tons of people before the Avengers attempt to stop him by bringing back a younger version of himself from the past who they hope can help to stop their Tony. This didn't quite work out as they planned, but in the end, older Tony and fake Kang were defeated when when older Tony, inspired by younger Tony, decided to sacrifice himself, switching back to the side of the heroes right before he died. With older Tony dead, it was decided that younger Tony would stay in the future and take his place. Number one, Tony Stark kills immoral Tony Stark. A crazy turn of events came about that led young Tony Stark to effectively make himself brain dead in the comics in the Invincible No More story. Following Secret Invasion, Norman Osborn created Hammer in the place of S.H.I.E.L.D. and created his own event Avengers, which we know as the Dark Avengers, mainly comprised of villains who adopted heroic personas to mirror that of the original Avengers team. To prevent Osborn from getting a hold of information that was gathered from heroes during the events of the first Civil War as part of the Superhuman Registration Act, Stark transferred the files from S.H.I.E.L.D. computers to his own brain, and then later wiped his own mind completely, making him brain dead. Tony would later return, but not really as the same version of himself. This Tony Stark would not have the knowledge of his actions during the first Civil War. 
How convenient. Number 10, Iron Man almost kills Tony Stark. Iron Man is really good at making suits, sometimes too good. At one point, he decided to make an AI suit instead of an AI to be used in his suit. This artificially intelligent suit did what most artificial robotic intelligences do, it almost immediately became evil. Although Tony did also decide to use some Ultron code to construct it, which honestly probably was not such a good idea, especially for someone who is supposed to be a computer genius. In the end, the suit created programming that allowed it to feel emotions, and after fighting with Tony Stark and trying to get him to forcibly merge with itself, it eventually felt remorse at its action while during their fight, Stark suffered a heart attack. The suit sacrificed its own life, giving Stark an emergency and what looks like terrifying artificial heart transplant. Like you can still see the artificial heart sticking out of Tony's chest. That. That does not look sanitary to me. Number nine, the Avengers kill Iron Man. Okay, okay, so the Avengers weren't solely responsible for his death this time around, but they definitely were the ones who caused it to happen. Nah, eh, at least in part. During the events of Armor Wars, Iron Man became branded a criminal by the United States government. Among those opposing the vigilante were fellow Avenger Captain America. This, however, happened at a time where Tony Stark was not known to be Iron Man. His identity remained a secret, and Stark simply claimed that the man in the suit was actually his bodyguard, often remote controlling the suit to kind of make it appear as though they were in the same place at the same time so no one would question his explanation of the identity for Iron Man. In the end, Stark decided because of being declared an outlaw to kill Iron Man, claiming that the man in the suit was named Randall Pierce and staging Pierce's death by allowing an empty remote controlled piloted suit to be destroyed during a confrontation with the government. This would later allow Tony to reveal himself as Iron Man, though he would at first claim another employee of his had simply taken up the mantle. But we knew the truth, it was really Tony in that suit, once again. Number 8, Zombie Hulk kills Zombie Iron Man. During the events of Marvel Zombies, pretty much almost all of the zombified heroes meet their end at one point or another, save for a lucky or I guess unlucky few. Iron Man is not one of the zombified heroes who makes it, however, he is one of the victims of Zombie Hulk who kills a bunch of other zombies when they start getting angry with him for well, for eating so much, as they fear their food supply of brains and meat is running low. Zombie Hulk crushes Zombie Iron Man to the point that blood sprays out of his mouth and eye holes of his armor. Basically, he squishes him like a grape. Number 7, Tony Stark sacrifices Tony Stark. In the Marvel Cinematic Universe, it was Tony himself who killed Tony, or while well, he chose to sacrifice himself in order to ensure the events of Thanos' snap at the end of Infinity War, which initially wiped out 50% of all living beings at random, including half the population on planet Earth, remained reversed, so unsnapped if you will. In order to bring everyone back, the heroes needed to time travel to retrieve the Infinity Stones and use them to create their own Infinity Stone gauntlet. Then the question came of, you know, who was going to wield it? The Hulk was the one to bring back everyone using the gauntlet, but Thanos from the past returned to threaten the heroic plans of the Avengers. He attempted to guarantee that his future self's plot, and really his own plot, remained successful, but Tony managed to get rid of him, wielding the gauntlet himself and using it to wipe out Thanos and his army with his own snap. Unfortunately, because Tony Stark is just a man at the end of the day, the amount of energy this required ended up killing him, despite him wearing his Iron Man armor at the time. Number 6, Dark Avengers kill Tony Stark's evil brain. In issue 190 of the Dark Avengers, we get a glimpse into the pocket reality of Earth 13584, where New York is one of the last vestiges of human civilization civilization that various superhero factions fight for power over. One such faction is led by an evil Iron Man who is now just a brain. His armor was crushed by a giant Janet Van Dyne of the same pocket dimension reality. As his brain ejected from the armor, trick shot of the Dark Avengers, Barney Barton, Clint's brother, shot the brain with an arrow, killing this alternate version of Tony Stark. Number 5, Captain America kills Steel Corpse. In an alternate reality belonging to Age of X, Tony Stark became consumed by a virus which fused him with his suit, causing him to slowly be digested by it. Ew. 
Formerly known as Iron Man, Tony adopted the mantle of Steel Corpse following this, which he thought was more appropriate considering, well, he was basically just a corpse in an armor. He joined the Avengers team in their mission to exterminate mutants, but when they decided to rebel against their mission directive, saving mutants instead, an emergency override system caused Stark to be unable to follow suit with the rest of his teammates. Stark told Captain America to save the mutants they were targeting, which he knew meant the Cap would be forced to kill him. Number four, Civil War. Okay, the opening scene of Endgame is wild. The remaining heroes, minus Tony Stark, head out into space to take on Thanos, with the help this time of Captain Marvel. They actually sneak up on him and they cut the gauntlet off his arm in like six seconds. They kind of win really fast. See, when the Avengers are united and they have a plan, things work out. The other crew in space in Infinity War couldn't even get the gauntlet off of Thanos. Quill was freaking out, the gravity was off, Thanos had the stones, it was tricky. But if Civil War never happened, I fully believe that they would have handled Thanos as a team much sooner. But by the time Thanos begins his quest for the stones, Tony and Steve aren't even on speaking terms. Okay. This all comes down to the events from Captain America Civil War. Now this ends with Tony and Steve fighting it out and Cap drops the shield. Tony blasts off Bucky's arm. It's heartbreaking to say the least, but it's one of my favorite Marvel movies for some reason. I like watching people lose. I don't know what it is. Number three, Avengers Disassembled. Brought to us from the mind again of Brian Michael Bendis, Avengers Disassembled is a five-parter that brings the team together just to be torn apart again. It is a ride. The story begins with the Avengers mansion sensors blasting to warn the team of an intruder. Now the intruder is the Jack of Hearts, who actually died beforehand saving Cassie, Ant-Man's daughter. So what's going on here? Why is he here? Well, Jack blows up, taking half the mansion out with him, along with the life of Ant-Man. That's crazy. And then the Vision crash lands with the Quinjet, starts attacking the rest of the survivors, and then She-Hulk comes out and rips Vision into two. And then while She-Hulk was going nuts, she accidentally hurt Wasp, Captain America, and Captain Britain. She-Hulk ended up leaving the group because of the guilt inside after she just wreaked havoc. Now this whole event is wild, even before Scarlet Witch is revealed to be behind it all. Spoiler alert. This is when Wanda lost her two kids because, well, they weren't actually her two kids. They were created from Mephisto. So she was upset. Eventually, she was defeated by Doctor Strange and Magneto took over from there. Now, this is where people, and I, want Wanda to go in the MCU. Perhaps studying the Darkhold and the recent loss of Tommy and Billy, she might make a big bad comeback. Who knows? Number two. Avengers Red Zone. Avengers Volume 3 Issue 65, titled Avengers Red Zone, is a six-parter that begins with this mysterious red cloud coming through South Dakota. Oh, this is a nightmare. So it's bringing a plague, basically. It's a red mist of doom. It's kind of like the movie The Mist, but without monsters, although it's just as terrifying. So everybody wears masks, because you know that's what happens when there's a plague and you don't want to, you know, die. You wear masks. Weird concept, I know. But it's still a war zone. People are dying off fast. Now in comes Captain America and the Avengers to save the day, figure out what's going on. And the team struggles here a lot. They get sick, they get infected, their motivation is just low, their team members are dying off, and things come to a fun turn when Iron Man and Black Panther create a cure. Great, but Iron Man gets trapped by Red School come part six. The team is not looking good at this point. Cap is down, so Tony takes his suit off and exposes himself to the mist in order to give Steve CPR. No sacrifice, no victory. Sam Witwicky. And finally, number one, Infinity Gauntlet. Coming from the minds of Jim Starlin, George Perez, and Ron Lim, Infinity Gauntlet was released in 1991, and Avengers Infinity War mirrored a lot of what happened from that event. Yes, Thanos wanted to take out half the universe because he wanted to impress Mistress Death this time around. He wanted to be her equal, whereas in the movie, he just wanted to fill people's bellies. The film adaptation was, in my opinion, Marvel's best work. All those characters in one movie, it felt smooth, didn't feel long, it didn't feel slow at any part. It's kind of great. In the movie, when Thanos is obtaining these gems, he toys with the Avengers in a similar way. In the comic, he turned them into strings and cubes. And then in Infinity War, Drax and Mantis had that happen to them as well. Even in theaters, I was like, this looks familiar, the whole cube thing. At number 10, we have Quake. Quake is originally a member of S.H.I.E.L.D. and is a decent hero himself, but he doesn't bring much to the table for the Avengers. One of her most notable contributions to the team is helping them take down the Phoenix Force, which is sort of a team effort more than anything. And her biggest task even in that battle is when she interrogates the X-Men. The main issue is that often Daisy Johnson, aka Quake, is better as a spy and a police agent than as a hero. 
She does have powers, but she spends more time interrogating people and doing more traditional police work than high level superhero work. Something that also seems a little counterproductive is that she is announced to the public as being part of the Avengers, sort of killing her anonymity as a special agent. This leaves her with a target on her back as a covert spy and without her spy work, she doesn't really have the power set to really keep up with the other members of the Avengers. Although let's be honest, the standards for the Avengers are pretty high and if you can find a way to stand out, you're lucky. Quake had a way to stand out as the covert spy on the team, but this was cut short by this announcement by Captain America. Even if I'm over exaggerating the significance of that event though, she still just doesn't make a huge impact on the team, even as an undercover agent. Hat number nine is Quasar. This hero is sort of like the Marvel equivalent to DC's Green Lantern, to the point where many people see him as a blatant ripoff. Starting off as a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent, Wendell Elvis Vaughn comes across a set of power bands which he uses to gain superpowers and become designated as the protector of the universe. Where this character falls flat is simply in the way that he seems to waste his potential. His powers allow him to traverse the cosmos and extend the bandwidth of the Avengers into an intergalactic context. Although Thor does that a little bit, he could definitely have helped. But he doesn't really take advantage of these supreme abilities as much as he could. I mean, he's the protector of the universe. You'd think that his story would break some more ground and offer the Avengers a more exciting addition to their already enormous bandwidth of power, but he doesn't. These days, the Guardians of the Galaxy seem to be filling the Avengers quotas for cosmic exploration and protection, which leaves Quasar feeling a little irrelevant. Maybe not a bad hero on his own, but he's criminally underdeveloped and a little bland considering the extent of his powers. At number eight is Mantis. Mantis is also very powerful, but she doesn't really do much for the Avengers while she's part of the team. After officially joining the West Coast Avengers, she helps them take down Voice, which is basically the extent of her work with them before that version of her is killed. And what seems to be a theme with Mantis is getting other teams of superheroes to help her complete her own personal quests, like the time when she gets the West Coast Avengers to help get to the bottom of her issues during the Fragmented Mind storyline, or another time when she gets the Fantastic Four to help her figure out some other personal issues. She does some pretty heavy lifting in the Thanos War storyline, actually facing him one on one, ending up in a tie, but she's not officially an Avenger at that point. She also seems to stir up a lot of drama within the Avengers, getting caught in a bit of a love triangle with Swordsman and Vision. She's definitely not the worst of the Avengers, but she doesn't do much to help them during her short time with a membership. Besides, it's the West Coast Avengers. They're not really the most powerful or impactful iteration of the team either way. Don't kill me in the comments if you disagree, it's just what I'm gauging from the online conversation. At number seven, we have Ex Nihilo and Abyss. This pair of strange aliens actually joined the Avengers at one point, and it's a really strange addition to the team, to say the least. Since they joined at the same time during the Infinity storyline, I figured I'd put them in the same entry here. These two aliens have so much power that where they really fail to make an impact is by not exploring these powers very much. This seems to be a theme in this second part, just heroes who have tons of power that they're never given the chance to use for whatever reasons. It also seems that these two extraterrestrials have their own cosmic destinies already planned out for them, and neither have much to do with the Avengers or any of their goals. My best guess is that writers included them in a moment when it made sense, but then after a while realized that they were too overpowered or not grounded enough as characters to serve the Avengers properly. Because looking back on them now, it's pretty apparent to fans online that they were never really fitting for the Avengers in the first place. At number six, we have Red Hulk. Another sort of pointless copy of an already established Avenger, Red Hulk just doesn't bring anything new to the table when he joins, and his attitude is just sort of unlikable at times. I know the Hulk isn't really known for his attitude either, but there's something about General Thaddeus Ross that doesn't really sit right. He's sort of like a stuck-up army general who doesn't know how to turn off his critical edge and be a team player. Well, actually it's not sort of like that. He's just like that. That's what he, that's exactly what he is. Although when he turns into the Hulk, he does keep his rational thinking mind, which gives him a slight edge over the Hulk who basically has a one track mind to destroy everything in his path. But as good as this sounds, it sort of acts as a lesson to the Avengers in that even though the Hulk can be a lot at times, having a rational tactical mind inside the beast can also cause problems because 
In the case of General Thaddeus Ross, his tactical mind isn't the most cooperative or friendly when getting things done, and he just seems to put everyone off with his approach to collaboration. But he's still pretty strong, so we can't get too carried away here. After all, attitude isn't the only thing that should be considered when ranking the Avengers. But even then, when looking at his abilities, he's not much of a standout member of the team either. No matter which way you look at it, he's still just a different colored Hulk. They've already got a green one. At number five is Rage. This guy holds the accolade of being the youngest to ever join the Avengers, but not much else. And this wasn't by design. Rage's powers were acquired by an exposure to toxic waste, which actually gives him the body of a full grown man, even though he's only 13 in reality. So when he joins the Avengers, he does it under false pretenses, fooling even Captain America into thinking he is a suitable age for the team. And even though they do give Spider-Man a membership to the team, he's always been known as an exception to this no teenagers rule. The protocol is typically to keep the team consisting of physically and mentally mature heroes who can handle extremely high stakes situations without issue. And unfortunately, Rage's failure to do that is what makes him one of the worst Avengers. He just shows a pretty immature disposition and it sort of overshadows his abilities as a hero. And failing to hide this immaturity, he also finds himself on the outs of the Avengers a bit earlier than he may have hoped. Not in the most gracious fashion either. Captain America basically catches on and fires him off the team once he realizes that somewhere deep down he's just a mere middle schooler. Number four, triathlon. Delroy Garrett Jr. is a pretty exceptional human, I won't lie. I mean, he wound up making it into the Olympic Games and won a total of three gold medals. So, obviously he's got some talent, right? Well, I hate to break it to you, but not really as he tested positive for steroids and was basically banned from sports for life after that. Turning to religion, Garrett ended up joining a cult that bestowed him with the powers of 3D Man, which basically meant that he gained various superhuman physical attributes that are approximately three times greater than that of even the finest human athlete. Pretty much he gained the powers he got from steroids without the steroids. Captain America eventually recruited Triathlon for the Secret Avengers, a team that worked against the Superhuman Registration Act, but Triathlon kept pushing for the main Avengers to be just a little bit more diverse, and that landed him on a spot on the main team for a while. Now in all honesty, that's all he did for the Avengers, make them just that tiny bit more diverse, so kudos to him for that, but maybe try being a better hero next time. Number three, Jocasta. Jocasta could have been super cool, but she was kind of relegated to just being Ultron's tattletale and almost loyal mate. She was built by Ultron to be his mate and bride in a sense, sort of like the story of Frankenstein's bride. At first he had tried to transfer the mind of Janet Van Dyne into Jocasta. This actually succeeded, but just made Janet in Jocasta's robotic body seek to tell the Avengers what was going on, and they put a stop to Ultron's madness, reversing the procedure. Jocasta would return a few more times in the comics, but never made much of an impression. She actually could have been a really cool character, but it always feels like she's never really given much of a chance to shine. Still often being resorted to plots where Ultron wants to merge her with Janet, even in the modern day. She was granted Avenger status when she decided to sacrifice herself in order to destroy the evolutionary's base before she died in the process. An Avengers annual issue 17 out of 1988. Number 2, Stingray. Dr. Walter Newell was a brilliant oceanographer and engineer who supervised the construction of a domed undersea city with plans to grow food for mankind. The city was attacked by the plunderer, but he was stopped by the Atlanteans Namor, the Submariner, and Lady Dorma, but unfortunately the city was destroyed. Now in response to this, he designed a suit specifically for the deep sea exploration that he named Stingray, as much of the design was based on manta rays. The suit can safely operate in depths of up to 1200 feet, has a unique oxygen diffusion system based on fish gills, grants Newell superhuman strength and durability to handle under water conditions, and is able to swim at high speeds underwater. Now Newell can also glide when not in the water, which is a pretty sweet add-on if I do say so myself. Also should probably mention that the main weapon of the suit is a potent electrical blast, so the name Stingray is definitely fitting. In all honesty, the only reason Stingray was ever an Avenger was because the team needed to use his hydro base as a launch site, when the US government placed airspace restrictions preventing the Avengers from launching Quinjets to downtown Manhattan. Other than that, he really didn't offer much else for the team. Sorry man. Number one, Dr. Druid. Dr. Druid was Anthony Ludgate, originally a student of psychology and psychiatry who was very much interested in the ancient powers of druids and those of the occult. He wasn't such a bad hero to begin with, but quickly became overshadowed by greater mystic heroes such as Dr. Strange. He also studied under the Ancient One, and after some successful heroic pursuits was made an Avenger. However, he became bewitched by Ravona Renslayer and did some pretty awful things, like manipulating the Avengers into making him chairman, usurping Captain Marvel aka Monica Rand 
Rambeau who held the title previously. Following this he got lost in the time stream and when he returned used his hypnotism to swindle someone out of their property so he could rent it out to make money and spend his days drinking. Since then he has died, returned and become more of a villainous character in the comics with his Avengers membership being revoked. Which makes sense. Number 10 Silverclaw Maria Santiago aka Silverclaw was born near the village of Kamakiri in South America and this village was filled with simple folk whose ancestors worshipped the ancient gods until the arrival of the Spaniards. Her father was a native of the village who was constantly ridiculed for his beliefs and his daughter was no different as she was ridiculed for well different reasons. You've heard of werewolves right? Well Maria had the interesting ability to transform into a variety of were forms including jaguar, anaconda, cockatoo, monkey, sloth and cheetah and they were unfortunately uncontrollable for a while which was not too great to say the least because it scared a lot of people. Now fast forward a bit and we see Silverclaw join the Avengers during the Civil War arc. And in this arc she fought Captain Marvel who was attempting to get her to sign the Superhuman Registration Act. Silverclaw was pretty against the SHRA as it was not the law in her country and she was not a US citizen. Now as a result a pitch battle between the two occurred with Silverclaw able to just so close evade arrest. After Captain America's assassination she did voluntarily surrender and was registered as a US citizen. Now why is she so useless? Well because she's not only just a bit lame of a character but she didn't really do anything of worth that landed her a permanent position on the Avengers team. Now I do like her power though, I can't lie. Number 9 Swordsman Ok so I'll give you that Swordsman was at least talented in his art form but at the end of the day he's just a guy with good sword skills. You might be thinking who are you going to rag on next Amanda? Clint Barton? You also might be thinking Amanda wow did you just use the term rag? Are you from like the 1930s? I'm not. Though I should be maybe. And no I'm not going to insult Hawkeye by putting him on this list. While there are many other Avengers who are just humans with super power like skill sets Clint at least is also a super interesting character. Swords Swordsman however remains quite dated, relegated to being a hero of the past. He might have been good with the sword but that also wasn't enough to have him save himself and also save his true love Mantis at the same time. Tisk tisk. And sure Swordsman may have returned as a cooler Katati version of himself but let's not forget that this is technically a different character. As well as Katati version has all of Swordsman Jacques de Quesne's memories, he is still an entity separate from Swordsman and made more interesting by the fact that he is part of the alien Katati race, let's be honest. Number 8 Star Fox Now originally named Eron and rechristened Eros at the age of 5, Star Fox is the son of two Eternals who has a pretty interesting power to say the least. Now what's that power you ask? Well he has the ability to manipulate the pleasure centers of the brain of any people within 25 feet of himself. This power emanates from him at all times and causes people to feel well good and by concentrating just a little bit more he can provoke extremely pleasurable sensations and make a person highly aroused, euphoric or totally sedated depending on what the situation calls for. Eros has spent most of his life fighting his power hungry brother Thanos and that's right that Thanos and honestly you'd think that being related to one of the biggest and strongest bad guys in all of Marvel history would make you a pretty useful ally but sadly you'd be wrong. The Avengers admitted him to their training program and gave him the name Star Fox since they felt Eros was a little inappropriate for a code name and he served the Avengers faithfully for several months helping them vanquish enemies like the Wizard, Terminus and Maelstrom. That being said though when he first joined the Avengers he intentionally failed to mention his ability. Needless to say when they found out he didn't last. Number 7 Two Gun Kid Another human Two Gun Kid is a western style hero. Sure westerns are cool but Two Gun Kid is basically just a cowboy. Take away his guns and his horse lightning and there ain't much there to work with. We aren't talking about the original Two Gun Kid either. The original Two Gun Kid was Clay Harder who first appeared in 1948 in Two Gun Kid issue number 1. This version of Two Gun Kid Matt Hawk would not appear until 1962 in issue 60 of the series. He doesn't have superpowers and he's literally from the 1870s so he wouldn't be a very knowledgeable hero in the modern day. In fact when he came to the modern day he had Hawkeye show him around, became an honorary member of the Avengers but then decided he missed his own time period so returned home. Peace. Number 6 Demolition Man Born and raised in Detroit, Dennis Dunphy idolized superheroes ever since a young age. After not getting drafted onto any professional football teams which was kind of his dream as an adult, he was approached by an agent of the power broker and offered the chance to undergo a process to increase his physical strength to superhuman levels, hoping that this would increase his chances of becoming a professional football player. Obviously he agreed and had his strength boosted but with his newfound power he actually couldn't safely compete against any other regular athletes. Not too long after Captain America took an interest in Power Broker Inc because of one of its clients, the Super Patriot. Patriot, and then soon after Dunphy allied himself with Rogers, created a costume based on Daredevil and Wolverines and captured Carl Malice, the head scientist. This unfortunately resulted in Dunphy's own capture though and he was subjected to more tests which resulted in a bit of a heart attack. 
Captain America thankfully saved him and nursed him back to health, and for a time, Dunphy acted as Steve's telephone hotline operator. When Cap reformed the Avengers, he gave D-Man a call, though one can't shake the feeling it was mostly out of sympathy. D-Man was quickly forgotten and lived a sad, sad life as a homeless person before resorting to villainy. Dennis is a very nice guy and hopefully he gets help, but he's really just not Avengers material. Should have stuck to being Steve's secretary, man. Number 5, Doombot. This is what happens when you let Hank Pym run the Avengers. In the series Avengers AI, Hank leads his own Avengers team. Who does he decide to put on it? Hmm, let's see. Doombot. Let's also acknowledge that this only happened because after one of the many battles against and defeats of Ultron, Hank decided keeping artificial intelligence as prisoners was bad, but he had no qualms with reprogramming them, which also seems morally ambiguous in my opinion. He also had no problem with putting tiny black holes inside them, which also seems very irresponsible. <laughs> True facts. Hank reprogrammed the Doombot to be loyal to him and made him a member of his artificially intelligent Avengers team, whose roster also included Victor, Mancha, and Protector. Yeah. Pim probably just shouldn't get to lead Avengers teams in my opinion. Certainly not AI ones either. He also created Ultron, so. Doombot wasn't completely useless as he was still a Doombot, but wasn't useful enough to be remembered. Sad face. After the AI Avengers disbanded, the rest of the Avengers lost track of him or didn't care to keep up and we didn't really see him again until he reappeared to help his teammate Victor Mancha find a new body in the 2017 Runaway series. Also you should read that cause it's really good. At number 4 we have Death Cry. This character has a very short run with the Avengers and doesn't really make a mark on the team in any significant way. What puts her so high on the list is that she actually forces her way onto the Avengers in a way that infuriates the other team members. Although part of me thinks this makes sense since she's a Shi'ar warrior who is actually commanded by the Empress to protect and ultimately join the Avengers. The only misstep here is that this isn't really her call to make. At least the part where she joins them for two reasons. Firstly, because she too is a teenager and that's a no-no for the Avengers, as discussed before. And secondly, because it's one thing to try and protect the Avengers, but getting an official membership takes a bit more than some altruistic bodyguarding. When she's first rejected by the team, she stays persistent and eventually sort of forces her way onto the team instead. But this doesn't last long as she's incinerated by Captain Universe, who doesn't even really mean to kill her in the first place. It's sort of her fault, realistically. She comes at him in one of her trademark berserker rages just because he takes a kill that she wanted for herself. So in self-defense, he raises a big ball of energy and she kind of just flies into it and just explodes. Not the most gracious ending to an Avengers member, capping off an equally ungracious lifespan. At number three is Thunderstrike, another knockoff character, except this guy is a knockoff of Thor, who just doesn't find his footing with the Avengers. This is probably because of how similar he is to the already extremely popular hero when he's introduced in the late 80s. But this isn't a coincidence. Eric Masterson, aka Thunderstrike, first appears in Thor 391 and actually has a quick run as Thor before he's demoted to Thunderstrike. And even though he still remains relatively powerful, his influence just plateaus as soon as he's left to exist in the shadow of the much more popular Thor. And not to mention, his costume, it's just pretty weak. He looks like an aging biker who only shops at thrift stores. It might just be the case that Thunderstrike is meant to be a bit more of a relatable version of Thor that people could see themselves in, but after he joins the Avengers, it proves that he really has no distinct qualities that set him apart from the rest of the team. No offense to him though. It's tough when you're a carbon copy of the God of Thunder just with a worse outfit. Might just be bad luck. Or bad writing. More likely the second one. At number two is Gilgamesh, or the Forgotten One. And the second name is fitting, because he really just doesn't do anything of substance for the team. He joins in issue number 300 of Avengers when the team is in the process of reforming. So I'm gonna chalk this up to a misstep in the writing process. My theory is that the writers thought that Gilgamesh would be a little bit more popular than he turns out to be. Although, I don't know how that would be possible as well considering his costume, which just like the previous entry, it's just, it's quite understandably known as one of the more boring and downright ugly costumes out of anyone on the Avengers. But besides that, his attitude is also known to be pretty arrogant and a little too proud. For instance, he often refers to himself as being in the higher ranks of the Ageless Eternals. And although he is immortal, you don't really go around pimping yourself like that. He has a lot of potential as a superhero for the team, but that's 
All the more reason that Avengers fans have been disappointed in his weak and somewhat unlikable influence on the team. Finally, at number one, we have Triathlon, aka 3D Man. I was sad to have to do 3D Man dirty and put him at number one because I actually love this character. Mainly because of how silly it is that he's based on the color palette of a pair of early 2000s 3D sunglasses. And how even sillier it is that his powers really have nothing to do with 3D anything. All these setbacks are the reason why I love this character, but I knew he had to make it onto the list if we made a part two, so here he is. And apparently a lot of people online agree that he's one of the all-time worst Avengers, so there is no better spot to honor him than at number one. Originally joining the Secret Avengers, Captain America makes 3D Man a member of the Initiative and puts him on the Hawaii team, which is self-explanatory. It's basically a team in charge of keeping watch over issues that take place in and around the state of Hawaii. And no diss to Hawaii, but there isn't much that goes on over there in the Marvel Universe, at least during 3D Man's run. One of his more notable acts as an Avenger is when he captures Scarlet Witch during the Axis storyline and brings her to a machine, Doctor Doom, in an effort to take her abilities. But he sort of drops the ball in this moment of glory and she escapes. Look, 3D Man isn't that bad. He's just a weird superhero that just doesn't really make much sense and the banality of his abilities sort of equate to his lack of usefulness as an Avenger at the end of the day. What can I say? Number 10, Civil War 1. Oh boy, the first Civil War caused a great uproar and a good deal of problems in the superhero community. It also made Earth vulnerable to attack as it evidently involved just infighting. When superheroes turn on each other, that's bad. When two main superheroes who are part of the same team turn on each other, that's ridiculous. And that's exactly what happened with Civil War 1. While the inciting incident that divided heroes wasn't caused by Iron Man or Captain America, and actually was pretty serious, they both had become leaders of two different approaches for how to best resolve that main issue. Iron Man believed that superhuman beings needed a shorter and tighter leash basically and should work with the government so they could kind of be overseen. Number 9. Axis Axis was an event where we saw heroes and villains sort of do kind of like a role reversal. This happened as a result of a spell backfiring, cast by, well you probably guessed it, none other than Scarlet Witch. Wanda, for being a powerful magic user, has kind of a challenging time with magic. Although to be fair, she actually wasn't the only caster involved here, although she is the one that we often talk about. Doctor Strange started casting with her and when he got taken out, Doctor Doom actually helped in his stead. So Doom is also possibly to blame as well. Even though Wanda usually takes a lot of the flack for this one. What launched the Axis event was Wanda and Doom attempting to cast this spell on the evolved and supremely powerful version of Red Skull, Red Onslaught, which sort of came about when Magneto was like, I know how to fix this, I'll kill you, and then Red Onslaught happened, so it didn't work out so great. The spell actually succeeded, but kind of backfired in that many other heroes and villains within a certain radius also got hit with the spell unintentionally. Oops. And friends, if you are loving what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, may I recommend that you check out our latest channel, Most Amazing Top 10 Anime. Number 8, Hydra Cap. Hydra Cap is definitely a pretty bad thing that happened for the Avengers in, well, in many regards. One, Hydra Captain America is literally another version of Captain America who for a while we actually thought was the main continuity version for real. So. We're not off to a great start with that. Number two, the Avengers failed to stop Hydra Supreme Cap from taking over the US. Number three, some of the Avengers were even manipulated into joining Hydra and Hydra Cap's forces. Some of them were actually like possessed and some of them were just kind of made to do so. All around, it was just a rough time and not a great look for the Avengers overall. I'm actually surprised there isn't more pushback from the public today as a result of this one. Number seven, Iron Man joins Kang. Yeesh, the crossing. What a weird crossover event. Every time I think I'm over it, we come up with the list topic where I kind of can't help but like return to it. In this event, Iron Man, one of the main Avengers, was revealed to be secretly one of the baddest of the bad as we learned that Iron Man had actually been working for Kang, or rather Kang's Immortus version, for years. That's right, it turns out that Iron Man is actually a sleeper agent for Kang, or he was. He kind of still is, because he kind of got reconciled into one being, but it's still the old Iron Man. Anyways, as weird as it sounds, this was actually an even worse weirdness than Captain America working for Hydra in my mind. At least that made more sense to me. Iron Man would fight against the Avengers, and when they struggled to defeat him, they called in a past version of himself for him to beat and uh, almost kill. Number six, final fight. When the Earth was threatened by incursions during the events of Time Runs Out, what did the Avengers do? Save the day? Try to stop those incursions? Not 
Exactly. Captain America had once been a member of the Illuminati, the secret group of heroes who banded together to resolve ideally all of Earth's problems without anyone actually even knowing. A group of super powered intellectual, philosophical and moral geniuses. At least that's what they thought. When the incursions were discovered to be a threat and the majority of the group felt that it was important to consider the possibility that they'd maybe need to destroy other worlds to sort of save themselves from it, Captain America fought vehemently against that idea. As such, his mind was wiped and he was decidedly ejected from the group. When he regained his memories, rather than use the Avengers to fight against the incursions and find a way to stop them, he actually spent the last bit of time before the multiverse was to end hunting down the Illuminati and in a toe to toe battle with Iron Man. Number 5. Create the Illuminati Sometimes it only takes one Avenger to mess up everything for all of us. And that's kind of what happened when Tony Stark aka Iron Man of the Avengers decided to bring together the secret superhero group known as the Illuminati. Like I said, this wasn't the combined effort of the Avengers. But when you think about the Avengers now and even before, Tony has been a staple of that team for a very long time. And the Illuminati was really his genius idea. His genius idea. The Illuminati as a group have definitely caused more trouble than they're worth, causing a lot more problems in the cosmos than they've actually solved. Playing a key role in the end of the multiverse during Time Runs Out when they couldn't save the world, helping to cause Secret Invasion and World War Hulk as well. So. Yeah. At number four, we have Stingray. This guy isn't ever really a true member of the Avengers. He is officially, but he only seems to jump on as part of the group when they need him, like when they need access to his underwater hydro base or when an inverted Doctor Doom brings him on to rescue civilians from a river. He's sort of their fringe friend that they use for water related issues. Could this be a case of lazy writing? Perhaps. But it seems more like he's not really a strong enough character to do much more than pop in and out of the scene when water gets involved. He also almost fights Iron Man due to a misunderstanding right when he joins the team and even campaigns to have him removed from the Avengers, which is just an awful way to start. At number three is Star Fox. This guy is just a bad hero. He's not even really a hero. His powers are extremely problematic in that he can basically gain the love of a woman on command. But it's not really love because it's artificial and it only lasts for so long. So when he uses his powers, these women often wake up not knowing where they are or what they've done, which is naturally a pretty deplorable thing to inflict on a person with your powers. And he doesn't even seem to feel badly after it either. He just gets his clothes on and jumps out the window like, See you later. Good luck piecing together the last 12 hours. Otherwise known as Eros of Titan, this guy is actually Thanos' older brother, so this sort of explains the evil nature of his powers. At least in the comics, they're kind of aware of his nasty nature, because the woman who he's used his powers on eventually come out and sue him because of what he does, which has to be a first for a superhero. I'm honestly just surprised that this dude even had a membership to the Avengers in the first place. He just, just kind of sucks. At number two is D-Man or Demolition. Man, this dude should never really have been brought on to join the Avengers. He's sort of just this unmotivated, scraggly guy with a horribly designed suit. He just steals Wolverines and Daredevil's costumes and makes a tragic mashup of the two. His origins are that he's basically a wrestler that was given superhuman strength before befriending Captain America. When Cap needs to reform the Avengers, he thinks it's a good idea to bring on D Man to join the team. But this choice is pretty obviously out of sympathy empathy for the guy because he doesn't really do much when he does join. He's then sort of left behind and lost in time, becoming more and more unmotivated as the years go on, eventually living in homelessness before becoming a sort of villain. Not the best track record for even an alum of the Avengers. But I can't totally rag on him. The Avengers have insanely high standards and some people just want to hang out and eat sub sandwiches. So that's D-Man. The number one spot on this list goes to Dr. Druid. Having been trained under the same mentor who trained Doctor Strange, you'd think this guy would have gone on to be a great member of the Avengers. Well, at first he wasn't actually known as such a bad hero by his own right, but after joining the team, it becomes pretty obvious that he wasn't destined for greatness. His attitude is arrogant, he carries a lot of insecurity about living in Strange's shadow for so long, and he also has a big weakness to the charm of women, proving him to have a pretty low emotional intelligence. And this is a pretty major fault when you're supposed to be an Avenger because you need to be able to have a strong character 
regardless of whatever your power set is. This also tends to lead him to be a subordinate to women in positions of power like Captain Marvel who he continually undermines until his disloyalty leads to her being seriously injured in battle. He then tries to convince everyone to name him the successor as the new chairman. This guy, Dr. Druid was just kind of a weak minded fool who was conniving and subordinate through and through. It's surprising he was ever brought on board with the Avengers because he really proves himself to be one of their weakest links while he's there. At number 10 we have Sandman. Although his redemption arc is really great and has so much potential, it sort of falls flat. Basically, the thing one day sits Sandman down and tries to turn him to the good side and it works. With Sandman now finding his stride as a hero, he first joins the Outlaws, a team of reformed Spider-Man enemies, and is then given a membership to the Avengers. It's all going in the right direction for the former villain until he's promptly hypnotized by Wizard and turned back to the dark side. Honestly, this isn't even Sandman's fault, but his quick turn back to evil gets in the way of him being anything close to a functional member of the Avengers. I almost didn't even put him on the list just because he barely even does anything for the team after he's inducted. And even tragically after that, he even goes off to reform the Sinister Six right after leaving the Avengers Reserve, which basically erases any good he may have done during his time as an Avenger. At number 9 we have Justice, FKA Marvel Boy. Although he's known as a pretty well respected hero, at least in his later years, Justice still doesn't do much for the Avengers during his time with them. When he first joins, he comes off as more of a fan than anything else, making some rookie mistakes right off the bat. He also finds a way to break his leg, which isn't very common for a superhero. Much of his lack of maturity in the group is due to his worship for the other members of the Avengers, so it's hard to blame him, although he does do some pretty good work in planning to take down Ultron. Later, he ends up teaching for the Avengers Academy alongside Hank Pym, Tigra, Quicksilver, and Speedball. But overall, this character's time with the Avengers is wrought with scattered accomplishments and distracting love triangle storylines that just make him a much less effective member of the team. At number 8 is Sentry, who joins the Mighty Avengers after having one foot in the door of the new Avengers for a while. This guy is a poor addition to the team simply based on issues of power imbalance and, unfortunately, his own mental health. On the power side of things, he's so powerful that he sort of drowns out the efforts of the Avengers as a team, which in many ways is a good problem to have. But on top of this, due to his mental health issues, he tends to have trouble reining in his power set and often second guesses himself. I feel badly for the Sentry and I only put him on this list because sometimes people just aren't right for a big team. When it becomes clear that Sentry is fighting some internal battles, he is still known as the most powerful member of the team, but just needs to figure himself out first. For example, at one point Sentry attacks Ultron at a moment when the team needed him to hold back and sort of ruins the whole plan. Although the attack was in retaliation for Ultron seemingly killing his wife, so it's not that unexpected. It's just one of the many times that Sentry has troubles keeping his composure and taking on the responsibilities of an Avenger. He's not a bad hero, just maybe not right for the best superhero alliance ever created. At number 7 we have US Agent or John Walker, formerly a stand in for Captain America. His true colors show when Steve Rogers returns and Walker is renamed US Agent, which is just a bunko name if you ask me. I had to put him on the list even though he does the honorable deed of taking over as Captain America when Steve Rogers goes a wall and becomes nomad. He's just a little too intense on the patriotism front and brings the team down as a result. A huge part of Steve Rogers' influence on the Avengers is his ability to shelve the burden of America's unofficial but basically official superhero and keep his intentions focused on acting in favor of others. He's able to put aside his pride and work for the team, whereas Walker does the opposite. He does work for the team, but it's a big lesson in the importance of good attitude because they have the same powers, but something about John Walker's suffocating patriotism and inherent arrogance that comes with it just proves that no one could do the job like Steve could. And once again, US Agent is just such a lame name to take on, unrelated. Especially after having gone as Captain America for a time, it's just, maybe I just feel badly for him in a way. At number 6 we have Swordsman. With the biggest accolade being that he trains Hawkeye, it's hard not to squeeze this guy onto the list. Basically, Swordsman starts off as a circus performer who is known for demonstrating his mastery with bladed weaponry. 
He was more of a showman than a superhero realistically and also more of a villain than a superhero if we're being honest. After losing all his money due to his gambling addiction, he decides to steal from the carnival paymaster and when a young Hawkeye chases him, Swordsman almost kills his own apprentice. And then fast forwarding, the way that he's eventually admitted into the Avengers is basically through fraud. He teams up with Mandarin and sends a fake message posing as Iron Man to the Avengers to allow himself into the group and it works. Being a double agent for Mandarin, he later lures the Avengers into a bomb with the intention of blowing them up. Although he does try to dismantle it in a moment of regret, he's still dejected from the Avengers anyway. I think they just sensed he was screwing around with them. He then basically just falls back into a life of crime while picking up a drinking habit along the way which isn't part of the reason I put him on the list. This is kind of sad. He's a very troubled character and just had some nasty intentions and tendencies. Not the most noble of the Avengers by any means. At number five, we have Jack of Hearts. This guy is notoriously one of the worst Avengers because his most notable act as part of the team is murdering another one of the members. Although he does this while under the influence of Scarlet Witch, there's no hiding from something so brutal. I mean, the Avenger he kills is Ant-Man, who's a really important member of the team. Aside from this though, Jack of Hearts also just spends such a short time with the Avengers that even his heroic deeds are sort of weak, regardless of the tragedy. Being the 52nd member of the Avengers, he's brought on specifically to help take on Kang the Conqueror. They all team up with the Justice League and a huge battle goes down. And then promptly after this, Jack tragically decides he needs to end his own life for various reasons, taking a villain with him who had killed Ant-Man's daughter. But it's pretty ironic that the next time he makes an appearance, he blows himself up and takes Ant-Man with him. Just a messy run as an Avenger through and through. Number four, Civil War II. Even worse by far than Civil War I was its follow up, Civil War II. In this story, we got more infighting, but for less logical reasons. This time, it was Iron Man versus Captain Marvel, because I guess Iron Man just really needs to like duke it out with all the captains. This one is one we can also likely more blame on the behind the scenes, as Marvel was definitely aiming to capitalize on Civil War I success with this follow up, but it just didn't work out too well because Civil War II didn't really make a lot of sense for most readers. But in terms of the canon, Carol, I think, was hands down to blame here for just being, well, unreasonably aggressive on the matter that was up for debate. Whether or not to let Inhuman Ulysses, a precog, predict the future and then based on those predictions, stop future criminals from committing future crimes before, of course, they even happen. Yeah, and I say that as a Captain Marvel fan. I'm a big Carol Danvers fan, but this one was pretty one-sided in my mind. Even I am like, I think Carol was wrong and Tony was right. And I don't say that very often. Number three, Avengers Disassembled. Avengers Disassembled was a story arc where the Avengers essentially imploded. What had really happened was Wanda had learned of the secret being kept from her, that she'd had fake children, which she'd in essence kind of made, who had been taken from her and then wiped from her mind by Agatha Harkness. Now, Wanda didn't like that too much, and in essence turned against Agatha, killing her before turning on her friends and colleagues, causing them to lose control, attack one another, and sicking reality warped versions basically of like Vision and Dead. Avengers on them. Not only did the Avengers hurt one another, but they were made to do so by one of their own. And likely were even somewhat responsible for Wanda getting to a point where she decided to turn on them. So really, who's to blame here? Is it Wanda or is it the Avengers? Or is it kind of everybody? Number two, ignoring Scarlet Witch. Avengers Disassembled was bad, but likely what was worse was that it kind of could all have been avoided if the rest of the team had simply, I don't know, cared more about their teammate and friend, Wanda. Scarlet Witch had a lot happen to her. And although this is, of course, superhero comics where every day that you're alive, there's a threat of trauma or, you know, of the world ending or both, there had been many signs that Wanda was not in a good place. Rather than do something about it or, you know, attempt to, I don't know, get her help. Mainly the Avengers just went on as though everything was fine. I mean, I know they all each have a lot individually going on, but come on guys. If you have someone with reality warping powers on your team and they are using those powers to create fake children, which then disappear without a trace after they also lose their life partner thanks to them basically being taken apart, mind wiped, and rebuilt as a blank slate without emotion, you might think to offer them some help or, you know, at least check in to see like if they need anything, if they need a hug or a 
a conversation. I'm not blaming them for what Wanda did, but I would at least like to hold them accountable for being pretty much awful friends to her in her time of need. Number one, no more mutants. Probably one of the worst things that at least one of the Avengers did was to threaten all of the mutant kind's existence with just, you know, a few words. Although admittedly, this wasn't so much Wanda's fault as it was Marvel's, who of course needed some reason to get rid of mutants for a bit because, you know, they'd sold the rights away and they weren't really profiting as much from comics involving mutants at that time. And they simply had too many of them. But reasoning behind the story aside, during House of M, Wanda in the end struck out at all mutants because her father, she felt, was more obsessed with fighting for mutant rights than he was with his actual own flesh and blood family. Although we'd later learn that Scarlet Witch and her brother Quicksilver weren't even really like flesh and blood family. To begin with, part of the reason that Wanda suffered the mental break, which caused House of M and later M Day, had to do with the fact that her friends and Avengers didn't seem to notice or perhaps care that Wanda was suffering as a result of losing her children. And in fact, let us not forget that Janet Van Dyne, the Wasp, of the Avengers was also the one who even kind of like caused Wanda to remember her kids to begin with. She kind of spilled those beans. So whose fault was M Day really in the end? It was still Wanda's. Wanda was the one that said the words, so it's still her fault. But Janet, why does Modoc often lose? Speaking of that question, what makes him so useless? Mainly, it's all in how he's written, I would say, and honestly, in his design. His design probably lends to it as well. I mean, he's just a giant head in like a floating chair. You know what I mean? It's his little limbs. Modoc, though, should be a terrifying and intimidating villain. And in some respects, and some alternate universe stories, he is. But for the most part, he is made a mockery of in the comics, despite the serious threat behind his name. And Initially, George Charlton was a man working for AIM who was experimented on and basically altered to become the ultimate tool for analyzing the cosmic cube, which was in their possession. As a result of his enhanced intellect, his head became massive and he was given a chair to aid him as he was no longer mobile on his own. At least, that's one of his origin stories. The chair that he was given was named the Doomsday Chair and George became MODOK, mental organism designed only for computing. MODOK. But AIM failed to predict what other side effects the added knowledge capacity and intellectual power might have on MODOK, who turned on those who had made him and ultimately became MODOK, with a K instead of a C, to be clear. Mental organism designed only for killing. Ah! Despite his kinda epic backstory and the meaning behind his name, I think MODOK is often used as a joke villain in the comics. Which villains do you think deserve more respect? How do you feel about villains being used somewhat as comedic relief? I don't know, me personally, sometimes I like it. I really liked the MODOK series, I thought it was really funny, but also sometimes it can work against a character too. And especially like, take away from their threat level, so. Like MODOK, Riddler is one of the villains who often just isn't that intimidating. I gotta be real with you. I mean, I love him as a villain and I love his gimmick, but there is honestly something about Batman villains. A lot of them have to have gimmicks, it seems. And for many of them, it doesn't add to their capability. In fact, it kind of limits their capability, if I'm being honest. Riddler is one of those. At times, he can feel unstoppable, like some mastermind who is many steps ahead of Batman. Although Batman, even if lagging initially, always seems to catch up since he is known for being, you know, the greatest detective in the world. But if you also just took Riddler and put him in a room with Batman and it came down to like a round of fisticuffs, I know where I would place my bets personally. I think you know where you'd place yours too. Being physically fit, simply put, isn't for every villain. This next one included. Mastermind is one of those villains you usually never think of when you think of someone that you just like wouldn't want to fight. You'd be like, Mastermind, I guess I'll fight him. It's not that bad. But honestly, he can be pretty dangerous. His mutant powers allow him to alter someone's mind, making them see illusions or even changing their memory in some cases. He was one of the folks responsible for helping to break Jean Grey when she was at the Hellfire Club. And his interference was part of what moved her along on her way to becoming Dark Phoenix. He's also been the person that's kind of been attached to the Void, Sentry's evil persona. That being said, at the end of the day, Mastermind powers are purely mental, which means that he isn't the most physically intimidating of characters. Also, it was established earlier on in his canon that he actually has to remain focused on the illusion that he's conjuring at all times. Like if he breaks the concentration, then the illusion just disappears. So that's also something to consider, even from a psionic powerhouse standpoint. Oh yeah, and his illusions also, if you like try to touch them, like you can go right through them. So probably won't touch them because that's how good of illusions they are, but if you do see a wall and you decide to run through it, you'll get through it and then the illusion is broken. So you can still break them. They're breakable. Having a powerful mind is of course great, but it doesn't mean that you'll come out on top. 
Look, Brainiac 5 is often presented as being allergic to Earth's germs. So while he is a powerhouse when it comes to how much knowledge he has and therefore what he can get done, the fact remains that if he decides to come to Earth to face Superman, which is where admittedly Superman usually is, Brainiac can't even really leave his ship. Well, not all versions of the character turn him into a physical weakling, more have than haven't ultimately. For the most part, he's a villain whose power is his intellect, not his strength and prowess as a fighter. So while he's still an iconic and dangerous Superman villain, in a one on one fight, in most instances, Superman easily takes it. Even if a villain can see the future, it doesn't always mean they'll be the most useful in a fight either. Like this next villain. Destiny is honestly one of my favorite characters in the comics right now. Her relationship with Mystique, her dismissiveness sometimes, her sassiness, the fact that she was pretty much one of the only people standing in the way of Sinister taking over initially in Sins of Sinister, all of this and more make her an amazing character to read about. But just because I can acknowledge how great her strengths are, doesn't mean I can't acknowledge her weaknesses too. Destiny is more of a person who advises on fighting than actually does the fighting herself. She doesn't have super strength or endurance or toughness. In fact, up until recently, she was dead for a really long time in the comics, proving just how squishy she is and can be. In a fight that comes to blows, she's not exactly the one you'd want in the middle. Instead, she's often better served, kind of staying off to the side, watching and looking to the future for strategies on how best to win here. Seeing the future is one thing, but how about villains who can see into and even control another's mind? Dr. Psycho gained more prominence thanks to his inclusion in the Harley Quinn animated series. Currently in the comics, he's one of Wonder Woman's main foes. That's just how powerful he is. And in the Harley Quinn animated show, he was also revealed to be pretty powerful and even faced off against Harley Quinn using a helmet to amplify his powers, kind of like how he's done before in the comics. With this helmet, he was able to control Darkseid's parademon army. However, the fact remains that while Dr. Psycho can control other physically powerful beings to make them do his bidding, he actually wouldn't be as good himself alone physically in a fight. Without his helmet, the best he can do is actually control one or two people at most. So against all of the Amazons, let's say, he would be struggling. This next villain has something in common with Dr. Psycho. He also typically gets others to do his bidding. Arcade is pretty messed up when it comes to what he's capable of doing. His main thing is being the guy to make crazy death traps for people to fall into and then later try and escape. And for the most part, he doesn't even really like make those necessarily himself. He like hires other people. He holds people ransom to basically get them to do his bidding for them. He is the creator of the deranged amusement park like location known as Murder World. He's kind of like Jake saw but without even like any moral code. However, I'd argue that both are equally deranged when it comes to their outlook on life and how they choose to treat other people. But I mean, at least John thinks he's doing something that can help people, whereas Arcade kind of just does it because he thinks it's a fun way to kill people, which is his job as an assassin for hire, I suppose. Arcade, however, as an individual, is honestly just a guy. A smart and twisted guy, but ultimately, he's just a man. I would even argue that John Kramer has more of a supernatural aura about him than Arcade does. Pretty weird, considering that Arcade comes from a comic book. This next villain is super iconic, which is why I felt a bit bad about including him on my list, to be honest. I'm feeling a little guilty about it, but when you think about it, the fact remains that Lex is, he's just a guy. I mean, he's a super smart, resourceful, and rich guy, I know, but still, he's just a man. In fact, while Lex boasts of being super intelligent, he's also made, honestly, some questionable moves in the past. Like, remember when he could have cured cancer and then he just didn't? The fact that Lex Luthor manages to remain as one of Superman's greatest villains is honestly baffling to me. But it's really something only made possible by the fact that Superman is super good and does not believe in killing. Because if he did, Lex wouldn't stand a chance against him. Moving on to another genius. If you know me, if you know what I like, me, Amanda, you will know that this is one of my favorite evil geniuses. Mr. Sinister was recently proven to be one of the most powerful villains around. He was so powerful, in fact, that he ended up managing to control pretty much everything and created his own version of the world in Sins of Sinister. Of course, this timeline would later be corrected and wiped out, but it's still impressive that he even managed to achieve this. But at the end of the day, Mr. Sinister is ultimately just a scientist. This means that when it comes to bronze, he tends to be kind of lacking. Like I know, he's also usually portrayed as being like a really big, kind of deezed guy. 
guy in some instances, but for the most part, I would say we don't present Mr. Sinister that way, and he doesn't have super strength or anything like that. But you know, he probably takes care of himself. He probably goes to the gym. However, case in point is his fight against his one time nemesis, Tarn the Uncaring, a mutant of Arako. Now, Tarn is an example of someone who can play with genetics and be deadly in a fight. This is because of his mutant ability to alter the genes of anyone just like that. Tarn, along with his group known as Locus Vile, were therefore able to make fairly quick work of Sinister and his group of Hellions. Our final point is an interesting one, because I feel like you could also make a case for him on a different list. A list where he would be considered the most powerful and unstoppable of villains. And of course, I'm saying that he is powerful here, just not particularly useful in a fight. Sorry, Joker. Joker is a great foil for Batman, because he embodies pretty much the opposite of what Batman stands for. And yet there's also a ton of parallels between those characters. If Batman is discipline, control, respect, hard work, and justice, then Joker is disorganized chaos without regard for anyone else or other lives, more prone to throw a plan together haphazardly and messily, and of course a symbol of injustice as the crown prince of crime. It's not to say they don't have parallels, like I said, they're both also highly obsessive people. However, just because he's the opposite of Batman doesn't mean he'd manage to survive in a one-on-one -on -one fight against him. When Joker survives his encounters with Batman, it's really only because Batman allows this to be so. Let's be real. Joker might be unpredictable, which makes him a challenging foe for bats, but Batman ultimately has more skills in a single pinky than Joker has pretty much in his entire being. I would wager. In at number 10 is Cyber. Adamantium encased arms and body, claws that inject victims with hallucinogens, mutant psychic tracking abilities, and even the ability to cast his consciousness into other bodies. Silas Burr has, or at least had, a truckload of impressive abilities and should be a huge threat, but he just kinda isn't. I'm not really sure why Cyber has been made to just kinda suck, but he really has. He was even responsible for giving Wolverine one of his most severe beatings up until that point in his very long life, and was partially responsible for not only Wolverine's training, but Dawkins as well. But in the gallery of Wolverine rogues, he just doesn't really have anything else to his name. He mainly worked as a lackey to other people, and even though he has all the advantages that he has, he doesn't really become much of an issue for his opponents. He trained Dawkins, but that boy takes Cyber down pretty readily. I believe at this point he is on his fourth or fifth body as the new Hornet, and he has transitioned to be a villain for Ben Riley's Scarlet Spider. And nothing against Scarlet Spider, I like that character, but Marvel downgraded him from Wolverine to not Spider-Man. Number nine. Starlet. Starlet is a villain that we get to meet in the series Batman White Knight Presents Harley Quinn, which I gotta say, even now, I'm kind of still reflecting on this on this series. At first I read it, I wasn't, I didn't feel super impressed, but it stuck with me a lot, which I think is a testament to it. The artwork in that series is also really beautiful, and honestly, I think it's worth a read just for that, but the story, a twisted sort of criminal mystery slash drama, is also quite good in this six issue mini. Starlet is the villain of the tale, with her true identity being revealed later on. Harley joins the case to help apprehend Starlet as a consultant. Starlet is targeting old Hollywood stars and killing them in Gotham as part of her plot. I don't want to spoil the ending of this one in case you want to read it, but you have yet to do so, so I will just say this. While Starlet is revealed to have some inside information, which is a big part of what makes the villain so deadly and ruthless, Starlet's weakness lies in their capacity to think logically and overestimate their value. In other words, a classic villain weakness in my opinion, that of ego or hubris, alas. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we're talking about here, and you love basically characters that are kind of off kilter, but have some pros and have some cons, be sure to check out our top 10 weirdest playlist where we talk about a lot of characters that basically are that. Number eight, Stiltman. Oh, Stiltman. No list of useless or less than impressive villains is complete without his inclusion. He is the biggest joke in Marvel's villain community and has been embarrassingly defeated by a large number of heroes, most of whom have much larger fish to fry. But his stilts, top notch feet of engineering. What are some uses we can think of for his stilts? I mean, outside of obviously reaching the top shelf or painting the hard to reach spots in a room, I could see this being incredibly useful for construction work or for firefighters or any kind of emergency service. Outdoors electrical work would be a breeze if you wouldn't need to use one of those big skyjack cranes. Window washing would be a big one. I mean, they could even be used for transportation. You know how much faster you would get from place to place with legs being that long? I think we can agree being able to stand at 290 feet would have a 
ton of helpful uses, but fighting superheroes is very clearly not one of them. Number 7, KG Beast. KG Beast has to be one of the most embarrassing villains around in the comics in my opinion. Despite being a supposedly trained and extremely gifted fighter and tracker, half the time or more it seems like he misses his shots in terms of completing hits tasked to him and he almost always ends up dead. Like. Not a great assassin, I'm just saying. More recently, this once again happened when he threatened the life of Barbara Gordon and came face to face with Nightwing once more in the Nightwing series. Important to note that here, KG Beast was the one to make Dick Grayson forget who he was before, causing him to become Rick Grayson. This was during an attempt on Nightwing's life, following him being shot. So as you can imagine as well, KG Beast was pretty handily defeated here, especially once the Titans sort of came in to assist a bit and Nightwing's friends came in to assist. Just it wasn't, it wasn't a good time for KG Beast again. Nightwing lived, but for a time would have amnesia and think he was Rick. And it was a weird time, and we all like to pretend it didn't happen, but it did, so we have to acknowledge it. And not only did KG Beast fail this mission, because he was basically tasked with trying to kill Nightwing, but he also ended up left for dead in an Arctic tundra of Russia. Batman basically used his grappling gun to paralyze KG Beast. This was during his time hunting him, which caused KG Beast to break his neck. Then after Afterwards, despite Anatoly's begging, Batman refused to help him. He was just like, I'm just gonna leave you here. And KG Beast was like, but wait a minute, don't you have to like help people? And he was like, I think if I just leave you here, it's I didn't kill you, it's just a thing that happened, you know? So bye. Number six, Johnny Soro. As someone who used to be a silent film actor before turning to a life of crime, it's almost fitting that the powers he eventually attained were all about his physical appearance. While battling the Justice Society of America, Johnny got torn apart as he was teleported to the subtle realms. Here, this incredibly terrifying eldritch being called the King of Tears reformed Soro with this new terrifying form that could literally cause people to pass away as soon as Soro removed his mask. He was intangible with his mask on, could teleport, levitate, and manipulate energy, but he still kind of ended up being a huge disappointment. Unfortunately, his main power didn't always work the way he intended. The wizard Shazam, as an example, was only turned to stone by Johnny Soro, and in the case of Captain Adam, he just exploded and quantum leaped through time, which is kind of just a weird alternative, but comic books got a comic book. His ability also doesn't work on people who are blind. So when Dr. Midnight faced him, nothing happened, and Midnight simply showed Johnny a recorded image of his face which paralyzed Soro and let the superheroes destroy him. He has come back from this somehow, but he's just never been as threatening as you might assume he could be. Number 5, Jan Rog. Jan Rog is just one of the most ridiculous villains out there in my opinion. He is from the Kree race and as such has an enhanced physiology, but beyond that he is supposed to be a menacing military leader who at one point threatened Marvel, Kree champion and also a military leader. Jan Rog was a colonel in the Kree Imperial Army, who is extensively trained in both armed and unarmed combat. And the Kree themselves are known for their military prowess and excellence as well as advanced tech. But for some reason, Jan Rog is rarely successful in his plots to defeat either Marvel or later on one of his successors, Carol Danvers. Jan Rog for a brief time was known as Magnetron, being revealed to have survived the Psyche Magnetron explosion and gained his own powers as a result. Because of course Carol also gained her powers from that, but then later we learned she was also part Kree, but anyways, moving along. At one point, Jan Rog tries to call home to the Kree Empire and attempts to make a deal with them, but not even they are willing to take him seriously, having seemingly forgotten who he was after all these years with him likely having been presumed dead after going MIA. Jan Rog call home. <laughs> Home says, no, we don't want any of that. <laughs> Bye. Number four, Pace Pot Pete. Peter Petrusky developed this incredibly strong glue that could have been the key to a long, prosperous, money filled life if he had decided to sell it or develop it further, or heck, even be a hero with it. The glue was handy. He could have been someone, but instead, this big old dingus became a criminal. But what's even better is that not only did he rob himself of a bright, non criminal future, since he decided to call himself Pace Pot Pete, and his main shtick was frickin' glue, he became the laughing stock of all the villains. Except for maybe Stiltman. Sure, Peter did turn things around slightly when he changed his name to Trapster, but like, not really. The damage was done. His glue could be useful in so many different ways, not even just day to day stuff, like he could have gone into construction or, or art, and I'm sure he could have even found a way to get into weapons manufacturing as he even was able to develop a weapon for firing the glue, but no, this Goomba squandered it all to become the butt end of a joke. It's a shame. Number 3, Belasco. 
I mean, Belasco is supposed to be one of the most menacing guys in Marvel Comics, right? He's basically like a demon lord of hell and a former ruler of Limbo, which you know is a hellish dimension, so I don't mean an actual demon lord of hell, but like Limbo's kind of like hell. And I'll grant you that on paper, he does seem pretty scary. But then there is the fact that he also kidnapped a young mutant so he could mold her into his own weapon, and she, well, I mean, she ended up kicking his butt, so as she rightfully should. Now, granted, this young mutant wasn't just anyone, it was magic. And we all know that Elyana is a straight up powerhouse, a force to be reckoned with. But the hilarious part is that Velasco is so egotistical that he thought he could just turn magic into whatever he needed her to be using her, and in the end, he kind of created his own worst enemy by ever bringing her to Limbo to begin with. So. Yeah. And at number two, Mr. Mixlepitalik. Now, hear me out. I need to make it clear that I am actually a big fan of Mr. Mix. He's really, really cool and just a blast to read. But as a villain, he's not exactly the greatest of them. He doesn't do more than be a pest to Superman and is even a pest to Superman's villains, mainly Lex Luthor. He has benefited Superman way more than he's hindered the guy. He is kind of kind of worthless as a villain, I'm sorry. But that doesn't change the fact that he is one of the most powerful guys around, being a reality warping fifth dimensional imp. He's just responsible with his reality warping powers because he knows the damage it could cause. But that essentially means he isn't really a huge threat. We have seen his same powers but in the hands of an actual villain when we got the Emperor Joker storyline, and that pretty much shows us exactly the kind of things Mr. Mix is actually capable of. It's a lot, but he doesn't do any of that. Instead, he just tries to give the Man of Steel a bit of a headache, which he does succeed at doing. Still, being Superman's number one fan makes him kind of a useless villain, but I am open to being corrected in the comments. Number one, Sleaze. Sleaze, wow. I mean, I think it's hilarious how much evil Sleaze could really be doing as a villain, like on like a huge scale, considering how powerful he is, and yet he chooses to basically just be like a huge creep instead, which you know, is definitely evil in its own way but it's still on a much smaller scale. That's interesting to me. You might know Sleaze from one of his sleaziest plots. To get back at Darkseid, he planned to force Big Barda and Superman to make a special tape. I can't say it on YouTube, but you know what you know what I mean. He hoped to make enough money to build himself an army which he could use to then get revenge on Darkseid for banishing him. I don't even really know how that would work because then you'd have American dollars and like can you use those in space and or was he going to make a human army because that probably wouldn't be too great against Darkseid. Sleaze himself, however, he's a new God. So even without capturing Big Barda or her Mega Rod, he could probably be operating much more high level schemes and even possibly threatening the entire Justice League. But because he's mainly just a huge creep, he usually just comes up with the weirdest, grossest plots and fortunately is stopped at almost every corner. Thank goodness. I mean, not every corner, but almost every corner. What a gross character. Sleaze has been shown to possess powers that allow him to alter his size, make others feel emotion, especially deep compulsions of desire. He can also drain energy energy or powers, and can even take control of or at least heavily influence his enemy's mind. So yeah, he should be doing a lot more stuff, but um, he sleaze and he was made by John Byrne, so he's just kind of a gross weirdo. And number 10 is I Scream. Now I need to get something off my chest. I Scream here is a mutant with the ability to transform himself into any flavor of ice cream. Literally any flavor, which gives me so many questions, but he has named himself I Scream. like. I as in eyeball and scream. Why? Why not just go with straight up ice cream? Or like I, like the letter, scream. In the comments, give me your ideas for what would be a better ice cream related supervillain name other than eyeball scream. Please, like banana split you in half or something like that, just anything. Either way, Ice Cream was a villain of the X-Men who appeared one time when he decided he needed to destroy the X-Men using their danger room. He actually got pretty far in that plan, sneaking into the mansion in his melted ice cream form and was even able to overload Cerebro, taking down Professor X temporarily before Xavier came back to and lowered the temperature in the room, freezing Ice Cream's ice cream form, which is when a clown turned him into a banana split and split from the scene. 
I'm not even joking. Just go read Obnoxio the Clown from 1983 and you'll see all you need to see. And at number 9 is Turner D. Century. Clifford F. Michaels was the son of a chauffeur of a millionaire named Morgan Riley. Now, after his father passed on, Clifford was adopted by Riley, who was criminally obsessed with the values of the very early 20th century. And in order to instill those same values into Clifford, he closed off the boy's access to the outside world. Because of this, Clifford despised the social norms of the modern world when he was finally an adult and exposed to society. This is what made him become a villain, dubbing himself Turner D. Century. He donned a handlebar mustache, a straw boater hat, and a striped green jacket and set himself to attacking any person or anything that represented modern society. So basically everything. After being defeated by Spider-Woman, he escaped prison somehow and developed the Horn of Time, which would allow this unremarkable hero to end the lives of anyone under the age of 65. Absolutely diabolical. But don't worry, the Horn didn't even work and just knocked down anyone under 65 in a very limited range, who as you can imagine did have the bodily strength to get themselves back up again and he was quickly taken down by Spider-Man. And at number 8 is the slug. The slug is just super fat. I wish I was joking, but like, this dude is obese to the point of immobility. He simply cannot stand up under his own power and needs a high-tech personal hovercraft to just get around. Luckily, he is a Miami-based crime lord, which means he can afford both his little hovercraft and the ungodly amounts of food that he needs to constantly be eating. On the plus side for Ulysses Lugman, his large amounts of fat let him float in water. It makes his vital organs basically impervious to attack and gives him a limited limited immunity to poison. He is essentially completely useless though against any opponent, which means he relies heavily on his goons, although he does have enough fat that he is infamous for completely suffocating victims between his roles. Unlike a lot of large characters like this, the slug isn't actually a mutant and doesn't technically have any actual superpowers, although it is worth noting that the official handbook of the Marvel Universe claims that Slug technically is a mutant because, and I quote, it is difficult to imagine how a normal person could achieve such tremendous mass and still remain alive. I actually had a blast making this list and if you guys love fun topics like this, make sure you like this video and subscribe here at Top 10 Nerds so I can make more. Thank you. But in at number 7 is White Rabbit. For someone so incredibly inept at committing crimes, White Rabbit sure does have a relatively long history in Marvel Comics. In the beginning, sheltered rich girl Lorena Dodson committed her first crime by ending the life of her 87 year old arranged husband, as she found the trophy wife life boring. She then used her inheritance to buy a bunch of high tech equipment and, being inspired by Alice in Wonderland, she went off as the villainous White Rabbit. For her first crime, she shall rob a fast food joint. This dastardly crime brought her into confrontation with the most fearsome of heroes, Frogman. And she almost brought him down too if it wasn't for the intervention of Spider-Man, who finished her off with an astounding amount of ease. Spider-Man has actually defeated her on multiple occasions with the same amount of ease, and she's even been defeated by Mary Jane Watson. Now don't even get me started on the amount of animal themed villains she has allied with. In fact, she's allied with a lot of other low level villains, but never to any amount of great success. She does have a giant heavily armed robotic rabbit though and that part that part is kind of cool number six critical mass okay so look we already talked about the slug and I just want to say I think Marvel has something against severely overweight people the amount of supervillains who are just massive is actually ridiculous the slug obviously but like the blob the shadow king pink pearl and the kingpin although that's actually all muscle and then there's critical mass aka Arnie Gunderson. Arnie was one of Peter Parker's classmates back in the fourth grade, but eventually he gained the mutant ability to project explosive forces from his fingertips, which is actually a really cool power. But that didn't save Arnie from being just a massive man for seemingly no reason. Together with some evil mutants, he formed the Band of Baddies, and with a name like that, you know we got some real winners here. The band abducted another explosive mutant named Mary Beck, which brought them into contact conflict with Wolverine and Spider-Man. Unfortunately for the baddies though, one of their number threatened Mary who then accidentally unleashed her powers taking out every single one of the villains. And we never saw Critical Mass ever again. 
The end. Lasted three issues of Marvel Comics Presents. That's it. Number five, Asbestos Lady and Asbestos Man. Some villains are just a sign of the times, man. Asbestos is incredibly heat and fire resistant, and back in the day, we really used to take advantage of the mineral. It was in thousands of products, and it even came into our comic books with the supervillain known as Asbestos Lady, who was fittingly a villain for the original Human Torch, the android Jin Hammond. Now, Victoria Murdoch created herself a costume made entirely of asbestos, which basically made her immune to fire when she wore it. Since it is no longer back in the day, we now know that asbestos is actually incredibly carcinogenic. Not only does it cause mesothelioma, but it also causes a lung disease called asbestosis. Of course, neither the writers of the comics nor the villain herself actually knew this at the time though, but that didn't save Victoria as she eventually did pass away at the age of 45 thanks to idiopathic mesothelioma. Kind of surprisingly, Marvel created Asbestos Man, Orson Karloff as well, who had no connection to Asbestos Lady other than also wearing an armored suit of Asbestos. And he actually survived his cancer, but continued wearing the armor, just this time he dragged around an air canister to keep him alive. He was unwilling to fight anyone, and everyone was afraid to go near him, which led to an hours long standoff with the Great Lake Avengers before eventually just surrendering and then apparently dying at a later date off panel, probably from the asbestos. Number four, life form. Now, Look, life form here is potentially very powerful, and after learning about this villain, I actually kind of hope they bring him back. But George Prefrock's time in comics came and went like a fart in the wind. The son of a fanatical right-wing libertarian saw George trained by his father to prepare him for the world. Although he wanted to be an actor, George was convinced by his dad to become a scientist. His dad actually also got George a job at Advanced Idea Mechanics, but I bet his father didn't know that this would inadvertently get George exposed to the pro-gamma virus. This virus mutated George into this grotesque monster becoming known as the life form. Now, George has superhuman strength, durability, a healing factor, and he can survive in water and the vacuum of space. But he's a monster. He even caused Frank Castle the Punisher to run away because his weapons had no effect on life form. Now eventually Frank knocked him into a river with a rocket, but George came back. Now with two personalities. One his normal peaceful self, and the other being the monster. George now came into conflict with Daredevil, but this time he was more of a confused monster and eventually in an altercation with police, his heart began beating so fast that he collapsed and then dissolved into a puddle. But when he reformed, he was put into battle against the Hulk by the alien Mercy, who also turned him back into an actual man again eventually. But this wouldn't last as he remutated and attacked an entire hospital. This led him into conflict with S.H.I.E.L.D. who contacted Mr. Fantastic who was actually incapacitated so the Silver Surfer took George to a dead planet destroyed by Galactus and then just left him there as he couldn't bring himself to put an end to this dual personality monstrosity. And that's the last we ever saw of life form, just out on the remnants of a dead planet. One part of him wanting to end and the other Half growing more and more hungry. Why is he useless? Because he is a massive wasted opportunity for a really, really cool character. And at number three is the Matador. There have been two people to assume the supervillain name of the Matador, and they were both arguably very useless. But the second Matador, whose real name is known only as Juan, is somehow much more violent and simultaneously much more useless. This Matador isn't even the main villain of the comic he appears in. When Daredevil Matt Murdock is in Monaco on the trail of a lawyer named Alton Lennox and his mob boss client, Tybold Luca, going undercover to a party, Daredevil comes to the main attraction, which is a bullfighting ring. But oh my god, the Matador was actually in love with Tybold's daughter, Lily, and was working with Tombstone. Whoa! He takes out Tybold Luca with his sword, and then eventually Daredevil knocks out both him and Tombstone. But the original Matador, he used his cape to distract and blind people, which he tried to do to Daredevil, who's blind. Number two, Stiltman. 
As far as concepts for villains go, giant stilts is absolutely one of the worst ones. Have you ever tried to stand on stilts? If you were even successful in doing so, you probably realized just how difficult all other tasks became when you were on those stilts. Now, imagine those stilts were 290 feet high. What's interesting is that if you go to his Marvel Wiki page, Stiltman actually has quite a long history being involved in many different storylines. Although, I think it's fair to say that a lot of his appearances were just a little bit of a joke. But still, his stilts are actually pretty strong. At one point, the strength of them was able to plunge She-Hulk so far into the ground that she ended up in the subway. But on the other hand, she beat him by standing between his massive stilt legs and then just pushing them apart, causing Wilbur to fall all the way down into her arms, where she just promptly carried him like a baby to the authorities. Now don't even get me started on Lady Stiltman. First of all, they couldn't even give her her own supervillain name. Lady Stiltman? Just Stilt Lady. I I don't know, man. But secondly, she was defeated by Deadpool when he opened up a manhole cover and one of her legs went straight down. Spider-Man even said that she was trying too hard and he webbed her up to a wall, which is just rude. And finally, in at number one is Paste Pot Pete. This guy rebranded himself and still couldn't save himself. Paste Pot Pete, or Peter Petruski, patented a multi-polymer adhesive that actually led him to become very wealthy. But being a complete doofus, instead of actually following that success, Peter decided to instead try and be a supervillain, creating a paste gun and successfully robbing a bank. Now following that, he decided he would next go after stealing a Delta Cosmic Missile from the military. And thanks to the Human Torch, this was a humiliating failure. Surprisingly, having your only weapon and tool as a villain, being a super glue gun, is not the key to success. And he quickly became a joke to the superhero community. He even rebranded himself to the Trapster, like I said, which is a much better name, but a little overshadowed by his time as Paste Pot Pete. Actually, that name causes him to go into a rage and is actually listed as one of his weaknesses on his wiki page. Despite his hilarious past, Trapster has been a recurring villain for years, although he is almost never taken seriously. Number 10, Polka Dot Man. This villain comes to us from DC, another Batman villain gone wrong. And get ready for a lot more Batman villains, cause he's just the beginning of some of the most useless. I'm not sure who would win between Batman and Spider-Man for most useless villains, but both heroes have their own pretty steep pile of terrible ones. Polka Dot Man, whose real name is Abner Krill, is a villain who uses a polka dot suit to cause his mayhem. He has no superpowers of his own, so he relies heavily on this suit. The suit allows Abner to remove the polka dots, which can change size and transform into a variety of different weapons. Where the suit came from is unknown. Did he make it? Find it? I'd like to think the latter because while you may be thinking this suit sounds pretty useful, and sure, maybe it does, Abner can't really seem to repair it when it breaks. Apparently the upkeep on it is so expensive that he sometimes just can't afford it. So I assume it is some kind of alien tech that is ultimately just worn by a regular Joe. Which means that he's somewhat useful in a fight, but if his outfit breaks, he is rendered useless. Number 9. The Kangaroo I love when supervillains are recognized even in the comics as being weak. And that is precisely what happens with Frank Oliver, famed jumper, ashamed boxer, and Spider-Man villain. Frank grew up obsessed by kangaroos cause you know He's Australian. It feels like Marvel writers were locked up in a room when they came up with this villain, and they wouldn't be allowed to leave until they had a new villain for Spider-Man. What if he's Australian? And um, what makes him Australian? I don't know, Jim. I'm starving. I just gotta get out of here. Uh, I don't know, kangaroos? That's, that's it. That's brilliant. We've got it. Needless to say, Frank is a former boxer who was fired after he seriously injured a fellow boxer during a match, and his quote unquote power is that he can jump really really well and um, you know higher than normal. Marvel admitted just how weak he was when they decided to give him cybernetic enhancements. The unfortunate thing for Frank is these enhancements just make him just like jump better. Like really? Even these improvements would not stop him from leaping to his doom in the comics. Though the mantle was later adopted by another villain and he was later resurrected. Number 8. 
stilt man. What's better than leaping somewhat high? Walking on stilts, of course. That's the premise behind this strange Marvel supervillain. Wilbur Day is a scientist who began his life of crime after stealing a co worker's design and using it to build a pair of armored stilt legs. Granted, his entire body is actually covered in metallic armor as well, and it is pretty strong. He even apparently managed to smash She-Hulk down through the street and into a subway tunnel one time during a fight. But being taller than other heroes doesn't mean you're automatically better than them or that you're going to be helpful in a fight. For one thing, there's that whole knock the legs out from under him strategy and two, his armor apparently has weak spots which have been exposed in the comics before to easily take him down. Iron Man at one point even fought armor with armor by throwing one of Stiltman's legs right back in his face after he decided to detach them so he could jettison away. And as a result, he knocked Stiltman out cold. Number 7 Fisherman Any rendition of this supervillain is like a diabolical but less impressive Aquaman. As to be expected as well, he is an Aquaman villain. His Earth 1 rendition was just super into fishing, something Aquaman is not a huge fan of considering global issues of overfishing and given the fact that he is an ocean conservationist. Which immediately put him at odds with the fisherman in comics. So what can the fisherman do to beat his nemesis Aquaman? Um, fish? And that's about it. Sure, he has a bunch of fancy lures, but so does my grandfather. And I don't think that's enough to allow him to take on Aquaman. I will say this, the new Earth version of him at least can breathe underwater and attempts to pull off criminal heists using the ocean and the creatures within it, but still, that seems to be his main power. And even then, he is still easily thwarted. Obviously this villain has been deemed so useless that he hasn't even really cropped up in the new 52 or rebirth. Number 6, Big Wheel. Ultimately a villain that could be very terrifying if he could actually steer the device that he uses to terrorize people with. The Big Wheel is a Spider-Man villain who often gets poked fun at, namely because his device is just so ridiculous. Big Wheel is actually Jackson Wheel who unfortunately came up with the idea to have a device built by the Tinkerer based around his own name. And so he got a giant, uncontrollable wheel. Spider Man dodges him easily in a fight, and Wheel usually meets his demise through being unable to break and falling off the edge of things. Number five, Crazy Quilt. I have to applaud this DC villain for being a supervillain with a disability, something we don't see as often as not. Still, his being a diverse supervillain was not enough for him to be saved from being turned into a not so strong supervillain by DC writers. Paul Decker was blinded by a gunshot while being captured during a robbery. He was a former painter turned thief. While in prison, he volunteered for an experimental procedure to help him regain his vision. This worked, but only partially. Paul could now see, but he could only see crazy, bright, and blotchy colors, granting him limited and disoriented vision. Seeing the world this way eventually drove him insane, leading him to adopt the supervillain alias Crazy Quilts. He built a patchy, bright costume and a helmet that flashes, blinding lights, among other things. His lack of sanity combined with his lack of powers and lack of true ingenuity when it comes to his gimmick make him an unfortunately easy villain to defeat. Not super useful. Number 4, Sportsmaster. Another villain who seems to be masterful at getting away is Sportsmaster. Not so masterful at fighting though. Not even masterful really at playing sports. Lawrence Kroc is a DC villain who is known for tangling with Green Lantern. He used to be a professional athlete and although he did have skills, he always took things too far and put winning above everything else. Becoming known for his cheating, he was eventually banned from all sports after severely injuring an opponent on the field. And once his sports career was over, he decided to turn to a life of crime. So interesting that people like fail in their careers and immediately deflect to this. Like crime ain't that easy you know. Finding another job might be your best option, cause not everyone can pull this off. Case in point, old Sportsmaster here. Sportsmaster disguises himself and fights with, well, sports equipment. So you can imagine how successful his career must be. One of his signature go to's in a fight is to escape by faking his death. Now that's no way to win a fight. You'll survive though. So that's a plus, I guess. Number three, Kite Man. In his original incarnation, this supervillain was pretty useless. Even within his newer incarnation, he's pretty useless. Chuck Brown fights with just what you think he fights with 
kites. And just as you'd expect, he is handily defeated every time he pops up in the comics. I feel like a big downfall of some of these gimmicky supervillains is that they get too attached to their gimmick. For some reason, writers keep bringing the DC villain back as well. He often tussles with Batman and was at least given a cooler hang glider to fly around in on, but still Batman manages to out hang glide him. In New 52, he was given a tragic backstory, wherein his son ended up murdered by the Riddler, who poisoned Charles Jr.'s kite string that he held onto. Ugh. Heartbreaking. What's even more heartbreaking is they gave him this sad story and still no cool way to avenge it. How unfortunate. Number two, White Rabbit. I'm talking about Jaina Hudson this time, Batman's nemesis from DC. Her powers are neat, but not really useful if you're looking to battle someone. Distract them? Maybe. But that's not really how you win a fight or are useful in a fight. She might be able to survive one though. Her powers give her slightly heightened speed and she is pretty good at escaping. In fact, as soon as a hero shows up, that's her usual go to move to just run away. Which gives you an idea as to how powerful she is. She does have a unique ability which allows her to uh, split herself into two people, separating her white rabbit persona and her civilian persona, Jaina Hudson. However, these two personas are quite different. So it isn't even like she can really use her civilian self to like help her take on the good guys. Number one, Condiment King. The Condiment King originally debuted in the Batman animated series and was created with the intention of being comic relief. So you can imagine, for this reason alone, he's probably not going to be very helpful in a fight. In fact, in the episode he first appeared in, when confronted and chased by Batman, he actually slips on his own ketchup and almost tumbles to his death. You know you're no match for a hero when you are defeated by your own villainous devices. He was later revealed to have been a former comedian who was brainwashed by the Joker, so it's good to know that he isn't an actual villain who takes himself seriously. Still, the brainwashing messed him up and he has since continued to try and take on heroes, jumping from the animated series to comics like fellow but ultimately more successful villain Harley Quinn. Number 10, Hugo Strange. This character first debuted in Detective Comics number 36 back in 1940. He's from the Golden Age and is one of Batman's first recurring villains and the first to discover his secret identity, but not in a cool way, at least not at first. In the Golden Age, it was more of an, oh, Bruce Wayne walked by and there was a bat shadow. Ha ha, he's Batman. Hugo Strange started off as a scientist who stole a concentrated light machine to take on Batman. He didn't even become associated with being a doctor medical type until the 70s. Despite his historical significance, he wasn't really much of a threat and his plots were well pretty silly, though that could be par for the course. The Doctor Strange people have come to know and appreciate wasn't introduced till after Crisis, so post Crisis on Infinite Earths in 1985. Here he is a psychiatrist trying to capture Batman, but he becomes obsessed. His whole origin was tweaked and made him a much more compelling character, and also eventually increased his intelligence and strategizing levels. He moved up from being a one time threat to someone who worked in the shadows and can mobilize other threats against Batman. Cold, clinical, and insane, Strange began to make the leap into adaptation and has now become a recognized character, from appearing in video games to Gotham to even Batman the Animated Series. Hugo Strange has secured his place amongst Batman's impressive rogues gallery. Number 9. Kite Man Kite Man comes to us from the Silver Age, debuting in Batman number 133 from 1960. He was a man who decided the best way to commit crimes was with kite themed weapons. For what is more menacing than a kite? This character quickly became a joke and was treated as such, an inconvenience rather than a credible threat. And really his whole getup was kind of unwieldy. But wait for it, wait longer than Crisis, we need to go all the way to DC Rebirth for this upgrade. Where all of a sudden, Kite Man got a makeover and a tragic backstory. He becomes a linchpin in the backstory of other criminals, for example working to design the Joker mobile. And his villainous career was a result of failed dreams, he ends up getting dragged into events he never anticipated. His affinity for kites is now an homage to his son. It's all sad, it's daring you to laugh at it. Now it's kinda like, oh yeah you thought it was funny, well look at this. He becomes Kite Man because his son was killed and his son loved kites. This was during the War of Jokes and Riddles, and he takes on the mantle of Kite Man as the ultimate joke before joining the Joker's side and viewpoint. It's an update, that's for sure. Number 8, Dr. Light. Dr. Light has had a rocky journey as a villain. We're talking about Arthur Light here, not Jacob Finlay. Arthur first debuted in Justice League of America number 12 back in 1962, and at first was a villain who fought against the Justice League and the Green Lantern, etc., but then became kind of a joke when he was paired up against the 
Teen Titans, the first iteration, not the cool 80s new Teen Titans iteration. No, the popular but aggressively hip 60s version. What's the pitch, daddy -o? Yeah, it was kind of hard to have cred when you're fighting teens. However, then something would occur that would ruin Light's character for years. Identity crisis. This 2004 storyline would turn Dr. Light into a rapist. Why? Just cause. He has no motivation. It's literally, oh, I'm on the JLA Watchtower and Sue Dibney is here too. So I'm evil and I guess why not? So after this, he was mind wiped by Zatanna and this is said to be the reason for his more kiddish switch and hence why he became a less credible villain. But then he becomes aware of what happened and well, he becomes a menace once more. But for a while, writers would just make him rapey. He talked about it all the time. The new 52 would change all this, making him a more enhanced metahuman who was a threat from the start. I mean, one could argue since he's on Teen Titans go so much, he's still jokey, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. All villains have a function, and if you end up the villain of an A-team, even if they're a bunch of teens, hey, that's not so bad. At least not in my opinion anyway. Number 7. Mr. Mind Mr. Mind first appeared in Captain Marvel Adventures number 26 back in 1943. He is a 2-inch telepathic worm who is an evil mastermind. The concept is inherently silly, but one of those ones that does a 180 and becomes awesome. An evil worm. It's too good. He formed the first supervillain comic team, the Monster Society of Evil. Don't let your dreams be dreams. Still, Mr. Mind would vanish for quite a while after the folding of Fawcett Comics. A lot of Billy Batson at the time Captain Marvel, his character is were considered quite outlandish and were a bit too kiddish. That was some of the mindset. But Mr. Mind would return with a vengeance in the 70s. Now, Mr. Mind was never useless, but he was kind of niche and less well known. The concept of him has become cooler over time. And the thing is, he keeps being shelved. People aren't sure what to do with him. But thanks to Shazam, people are aware of this little critter again and just how powerful he can be. This is Mr. Mind's time to shine, or at least I hope it is. Please give me Mr. Mind as the lead villain in a movie. I want the plushie. Think of how cute that would be. Number six, Craven the Hunter. Scandalous, some of you cry. But Craven was not always considered the hardcore cool character he is today. In fact, a lot of that cred can be attributed to Craven's last hunt, where he quite succinctly takes down Spider Man just to prove he can. Craven first appeared in The Amazing Spider Man number 15 back in 1964. He's also the chameleon's half brother. Fun fact. Craven is Sergei Kravenov, and well, here's the thing certain Spidey writers at the time didn't like him. They thought he was silly. It was only during the last time storyline when Dematisse learned that the character was Russian and made him think that he should have a tragic personality to match. Craven's last hunt was initially conceived with another character in mind, and then it became a Craven story afterwards. This began Craven's ascent to beloved villain, though of course some have been there all along, villain hipsters. Craven is now sought after to be adapted into live action. Whenever people hear there's going to be a new villain, there's always a group who's like, Craven? What? Where? Number 5. Captain Cold A lot of this is owed to the CW, but not all of it. Captain Cold has long been an antagonist of The Flash, both Barry Allen and Wally West. He first debuted in Showcase number 8 back in 1957. Leonard Snart fell prey to a rep ascribed to The Flash's villains, oft times by people who didn't read The Flash, namely that his villains were silly. And how could Cold be the opposite of Fast? Shouldn't his true antagonist be the Turtle Man? Thank goodness it wasn't. Over time, Captain Cold would come to be the de facto leader of the Flash's rogues gallery, and a quasi frenemy of the Flash, and one of the most well known rogues. Then the Flash CW show happened, and now people have a crush on Captain Cold, a move that cements you in the public consciousness. Just look at Loki. Now he's got his own solo series again and is wearing terrible punny shirts that cause me physical pain. Captain Cold has been credible for a while now, but I still wanted to talk about him. Also, because I wanted to tell you about this hilarious classic tale where Barry Allen thought he was Captain Cold. Cold. It's great. Am I the Flash or Captain Cold? Number four, Sinestro. This one may be hard for some to believe since Sinestro is so credible now and his history is iconic. But there was a time when Sinestro was just kind of meh as a villain. And the Sinestro core was pretty much just Sinestro with a yellow ring that only mattered because it was yellow and lanterns couldn't deal with yellow at the time because reasons. Sinestro suffered a few resets along with Hal Jordan, the Silver Age Green Lantern, because throughout the period leading up to Hal's death, and Sinestro's death actually, the comic complaint about Hal and the Green Lantern book in general was that it was boring with a capital B. I disagree, but I read it now. I can't speak to what it was like reading it at the time. The time when you read things adds context to how it is received and thusly how much you enjoy it. It's always important to examine these things. Or, you know, don't. Sinestro first debuted in Green Lantern Volume 2, Number 7 back in 1961 and was an ally to Hal at first before his true nature was revealed. However, it would be after his death, actually at the hands of Hal and his resurrection, that he would rise more 
more powerful than ever before, with a really lame explanation as to how he was fine, but we're just gonna let that go. Sinestro would become the leader of the Yellow Lantern Corps, or the Fear Corps, his rigid, well-disciplined personality making him a perfect threat to the galaxy and counterpoint to Hal Jordan. Sinestro is up there with the core villains now. It was hard fought. I've always liked Sinestro. I don't think I'm boring. I'm fun. Number three, the Penguin. The Penguin first debuted in Detective Comics number 58 back in 1941. Now the Penguin started off as just your average villain, distinguished largely by his bird-like appearance and iconic umbrella. At first an affectation brought on by an overprotective mother. He was a thief who would team up with other rogues often. And he would largely vanish for a time post-crisis. But then after a tale helmed by Alan Grant, his cred would begin to rise. The aspects of his personality that made him want to be a gentleman and criminal would begin to come to the fore. His desire for sophistication, which so contrasted with his appearance, made him an intriguing combination. And he was one of the villains to get the spotlight on the seminal Batman the Animated Series, which would launch the DCAU, that being the DC Animated Universe. Penguin would eventually become the owner of the Ice Club, and cement himself as a villain who had ties to organized crime and was above petty street level fare. The thing is he can do both, and he has friends in both worlds. The Penguin is a serious villain, he's always been around, but he's definitely increased his credibility over the years. Number 2, Catman. Na 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 Catman. He first debuted in Detective Comics number 311 back in 1963. He was Thomas Reese Blake, a jungle trapper who turned to crime because he was bored and had run out of money because he wasted it. He actually modeled his costume off of Catwoman, and she was annoyed that he was stepping on her turf as a cat-themed villain. Cause yes, he used to go for cat themed items as well. He would later adopt an African styled costume that would always suffer from the fact that he looked like a lame Batman ripoff. But then Gail Simone created the team The Secret Six, and on it was a revamped version of Catman. You know one of those attempts to make a character hardcore and awesome, only it actually worked, largely because it acknowledged his lame past and made fun of it. Now Blake was a grizzled cat lover, yes, but no longer a hunter of them. He was a loner and a reluctant leader. He was also bisexual, which you find out because Gail Simone was tweeting about it, and about how she was going to make it canon next time she wrote the book. Everybody on Twitter has a chance to turn to JK Rowling. Still, I mean, it was pretty obvious that he had a thing for Deadshot. What Secret Six really did for Catman was it made him interesting and detailed him, and I'm a sucker for him in The Huntress. Hero villain things? Sign me up. He's now been permanently upgraded to cool, or so it seems, and he even kept that costume for a bit. Now that's a feat. And number one, The Riddler. Now some of you may be going, hold up, come on, but hear me out. The Riddler first debuted in Detective Comics number 140 back in 1948. His gimmick was that he loved riddles, puzzles, and all that kind of fare. And it would eventually become an obsession that he had to leave riddles, even if they would lead to him being caught. While the Riddler would be a threat that Batman would have to deal with, many times at the start it didn't feel too dire, it was more of a game. And sometimes the riddles, well, they were lame. But over time the Riddler would get a cunning boost and go through phases of being menacing, knowing Batman's secret identity, or planning elaborate chess like crimes where the riddles could be multi-nuanced. He would find legitimacy in games as a mastermind, and an intriguing portrayal on Gotham, arguably one of its highlights. His complexity would be increased, and his desire to be taken seriously as a villain would become a plot point. There's been a big push for him of late at the time of this recording, like in the changed ending of the animated Hush film. Personally, I'm a fan of the reformed Riddler, which is a while back in the past nowadays. Connor wants me to talk about Jim Carrey Riddler, but we're talking about increased menace and cred, not talking about taking him back to camp. Although there are some moments there, hints of darkness that made me wish that it had been played that way the entire film. The Riddler's definitely up there with being able to be a threat to Batman on multiple fronts now, and is finally a villain other villains take seriously as well. Number 10, Zeitgeist. Okay, he didn't actually initially start as a villain. Instead, Axel Clunny was actually the leader of the celebrity superhero mutant group known as X Force. But after his death and revival, he did indeed become a criminal and villain. Now, Zeitgeist has a pretty unfortunate mutant superpower that first manifested in a very unfortunate incident. Basically, Zeitgeist could spew acidic vomit from his mouth, and he wore a protective mouthpiece in and out of his costume. He discovered this power during a little makeout sesh at a beach where he accidentally vomited and melted the girl's face half off. She did survive, but the real kicker is he can't even remember her name. See, he's not really a good guy at all. It was shown that his vomit could burn through 10 centimeter thick steel in less than 30 seconds. Again, not a horrible power, just 
really, really unfortunate. Number nine, Armless Tiger Man. Gustav Hertz worked in a mechanical laboratory in Munich, Germany during the 1940s. Now, one day, his arms were caught in a machine and were amputated. Surviving the experience and given reading material on how to operate day to day using his mouth and feet, Hertz developed skill in using his teeth and his feet in place of his amputated arms. He has sharpened his teeth into fangs to use as weapons and has above average strength, allowing him to bend steel with his mouth. His toes are also very dexterous, allowing him to throw daggers with them, which is actually kind of cool in a little bit of a weird way. He was an enemy of the World War II hero Angel, which is not Warren Worthington. He was also an enemy of Wakanda, and after death, he even came into sort of indirect conflict with Hercules. That's cool. Hey guys, if you're enjoying this video and you haven't already, make sure to press that subscribe button to join us here at Top 10 Nerd. We're almost at 1.30 million subscribers, so definitely get on that. Number eight, The Living Eraser. The Living Eraser is no mere man, you earthbound fools. Sorry, I love that quote from this character. It's kind of hilarious. Kutsa here is actually a Thalumian, and he was the agent of the supremacy. And as an agent, he would use his dimensionalizer to kidnap scientists for nefarious designs. Ooh. The Living Eraser's dimensionalizer can transport people to other dimensions, primarily between Earth and Dimension Z. As the dimensionalizer passes over a surface, it turns it invisible, making it appear as if the victim is being erased. When the entire surface has been transformed, the being or object is transported across dimensions to its destination. If he literally erased people, it would be way more scary, but sending them to another dimension is a fixable thing in comics, so it's not exactly the worst. Number seven, Boomerang, but from Marvel. Fred Myers was born in Australia, but moved to America when he was a small child. Now in America, his great love was baseball, and he developed an extraordinary pitching arm. He became a professional baseball player in the minor leagues after graduating high school, and a few years later entered into to the major leagues. Within a year though, he was suspended for accepting bribes. Now with an arm like that and no job, he was eventually contracted by the subversive criminal organization, the Secret Empire, and offered employment. They designed special weaponry for him to exploit his pitching ability, and he became their special operative, codenamed Boomerang. Now why Boomerang specifically, and not like I don't know, a baseball? Because he was born in Australia and that is the only projectile they have in that country, obviously. Number six, Count Vertigo. Now you listen here, okay? Count Werner Vertigo is of royal blood. He is an heir to the throne of Latava, truly the most prestigious of titles, okay? But don't you think for one second that means he has cool superpowers, because he doesn't. Count Vertigo has a hereditary inner ear defect that affected his balance. That's not a superpower. Vertigo had a small electronic device implanted in his right temple, though, that compensated this problem. Tinkering with that device, Vertigo learned he was able to affect other people's balance as well, distorting their perceptions so that they literally could not tell up from down which is an effect known as vertigo, and he used this skill to fight Green Arrow. He'd also use it to join up with the Suicide Squad and Checkmate, using his powers to make people dizzy to his advantage. Very nice. Number five, Codpiece. Personally, I would have loved to be a fly on the wall when the character of Codpiece was conceived. Codpiece is honestly just a guy with a massive inferiority complex. That's what it says on his wiki though. I'm not, I, I didn't make that up. Okay. Look, in high school, a girl told him he wasn't tall enough, but he thought she meant something else. And so instead of getting like a broken muffler or giant wheels on a giant truck, Codpiece created a suit that had a Codpiece multi-weapon built into the crotch area. The Codpiece had a wide variety of functions, including a cannon, missiles, a sonic attack, two retractable boxing gloves, and a variety of tools such as drills and scissors. If there is one way to compensate, it is by becoming a multi-tool. Look. He's doing the best with what he's got, okay? Number four, Polka Dot Man. While this character got a bit of a change up in the recent Suicide Squad movie, Polka Dot Man, real name Abner Krill, in the comics didn't have a power. He instead wore a suit that was covered in different colored polka dots. When these polka dots were attached to the suit, they had no function, but once they were pulled off, they would enlarge and turn into different gimmicky weapons, like flying buzz saws, blinding sun-shaped dots, dots that turn into fist-shaped projectiles, and even one that turned into a portal. That sounds kind of cool. The dots would even self-destruct to prevent anyone from studying the tech. The only problem was that the polka dot gadgets and the electronic suit were expensive to maintain, and Krill was just literally unable to afford it sometimes. The struggle is real, man. I feel you. Number three, Paste Pot Pete. 1963's Strange Tales number 104 states, Human Torch battles the most fantastic foe of all. Pace Pot Pete and his unbeatable super weapon. 
Now said unbeatable super weapon just happened to be a glue gun that fired an extremely adhesive multi-polymer liquid that he invented. Pacepot Pete, otherwise known as Peter Petrusky, or even Trapster, created a not hot glue gun and his idea was to use this to commit crimes. As you can imagine, the Human Torch really had no problems whatsoever taking down old Pete here. And he continued to do so multiple times because Pete does not know when to give up, apparently. Number two, Kite Man. Kite Man. Hell yeah. Now real me this, nerds. What good are powers like reality warping, energy projection, telekinesis, and super strength against the guy who flies around on a giant kite? Yeah. I'd like to see the Justice League take on Charles Brown and his giant kite. There's no way anyone could possibly stand against that. No sir, not at all. Kite Man possessed a variety of gimmicked kites, including a jet-powered hang glider that allowed for quick escapes, a mammoth kite that the Kite Man used to shuttle criminals out of Gotham's prison, a flashbulb kite, and a trap net kite. Although, in more recent times, he did temporarily possess the powers of titans. Those abilities pale in comparison to the might of a good kite at your side, though. And in at number one is Ten-Eyed Man. Okay, it's a DC writer's room. You and your buds are sitting around the table. You need a villain, but someone different, someone unique, someone who could pose a threat to the cave. Crusader, a villain that requires intelligence to beat, some could say. Then all of a sudden, Frank stands up. I've got it! We take away a man's ability to see, and instead, his vision will come from his fingertips, five eyes on each hand. A brief moment of silence follows as the genius that would become Philip Reardon, the ten eyed man, has just been created. That is his only power, and as you can imagine, this does pose some problems. For starters, his regular eyes are blind. Also, he is often easily defeated simply by injuring his very sensitive eye fingers, which can be done by tricking him into catching or touching something, or even theoretically giving him a high five. But let's not forget it has been shown he can only be kept in a jail cell by keeping his hands locked in a special non-see-through box because with eyes on his fingers, quote, escape would be child's play for him. It's true. Coming at number 10, we have Shocker. I think back when this villain was created, the idea of having someone who had vibrations as their superpower would have been a little bit harder to make fun of. Now, many of you probably know Shocker. He has had a few moments in the sun, popping up in video games, and he even has a moment as one of the henchmen of the Vulture. Now you think someone who is canon in the MCU wouldn't fit onto this list, but when we break him down, we start to learn that Shocker isn't that shocking. It would seem that this villain has a knack for losing to Spider-Man every Every single time, and it's probably because his powers aren't that impressive. He can make shockwaves that blast through the air, and he can make vibration shields. Yeah, I'm not that impressed by what you have to offer. In recent years, we have seen less and less of this punchline of a villain, as I think the writers have seen that his time has come, and he will soon be put to bed. As a kid, I always got him and Electro mixed up, because I thought shocker meant that he was electrocuting people, because he was shocking them. Well, at least for the new generation, you won't have those problems, because this guy is going to be gone pretty soon. Coming at number 9, we have White Rabbit. I mean, right when we start breaking down this villain, you will learn why she is on this list. It's one thing to be a down and out loser who's had enough of the cruel world and now wants to dive into a world of crime because everything else has let them down. But when you come from a rich family and you turn to crime just for the sake of being angsty, then I don't really have much compassion for you and your character isn't really relatable. The White Rabbit, also known as Lorena Dodson built her persona off the Alice in Wonderland book. She thought that would be a cool and edgy way to get into the world of crime. I think she just indulged in too many psychedelics and maybe went off the deep end. I wouldn't be surprised if this character was inspired by the rise of LSD in the 80s when this character was birthed. In terms of powers, she has zero. All she has is a bad attitude and a general understanding of martial arts. She's not a villain that any of us are clamoring for. Coming in at number 8, we have Mind Worm. You know, for some of these villains, it seems that the writers went to so much work to really come up with someone who was interesting and had motivations for evil, but then they just throw them in the toilet, and that's what really happens with Mindworm. Mindworm starts off great. He has powers from birth. He's some sort of mutant kid with a huge head. Of course, he's weird and kids don't like him, but at least his parents love his huge cranium. But what Mindworm doesn't know is that he's feeding off the psionic energy of his parents, draining their brain. Eventually, 
he gets too greedy with this and he kills his own mother and father. He didn't mean to do this, he was just a young mutant kid who didn't know any better and now he was an orphan. From there he was bullied in the orphanage and he learns how to use his powers. Eventually he grows up and is living in a New York apartment where he's feeding off all the people in the building and getting pretty strong off this. But Spider-Man moves in and he senses that someone's trying to suck out his brain energy. The two have a clash and Mindworm is killed by some gang members. Like all of that work into building up who this guy is and he was gone just like that. What a waste. Coming in at number 7 we have Gibbon. We got back to back orphanage stories for you. In fact this one sounds like a cross between Mindworm and Robin. Gibbon is basically the missing link. He has all the abilities of a chimp that are amplified way up. He's got super strength, speed, awareness, reflexes. This guy is off the charts when you're talking about his Madden stats. But because of his monkey like ways the kids didn't really like him in the orphanage and he was never adopted. Now this ended with him growing up and leaving like a regular dude. Dude, but now he was just a freak with no money, so he decided he could use his mutations to make some cash. And what's the best way for an oddity to make a quick buck? Well, the circus, of course. There you would think he would be among his people, but he was rejected once again, and now he turned to a life of villainy. When we first see Gibbon, he's just a dude that has some monkey skills, but in later renditions of his character, he looks like a full on ape man. And even though he has the abilities to take down Spidey, the clashes between the two always end up with Gibbon on his butt. Coming in at number 6 we have The Answer. Now this guy is actually pretty cool, he's just used in a very lame way and his name sucks. The Answer was already a skilled assassin, he was working for the mob boss of all mob bosses Wilson Fisk. Anyone Fisk wanted taken down, he was all over it. And part of why he was so good at his job was because The Answer, at this time he was known as Aaron Nichols, is extremely intelligent. He showcases genius level problem solving skills and he can come up with the answer to any problem problem, and this is all before he ever gets any sort of superpowers. There was a time in comics when the kingpin was just handing out superpowers, but you don't give the first powers to someone you can't trust, so he of course gave his first dose of super juice to his buddy Aaron. But at first glance nothing happened, which is probably a relief and a bummer, because if you take some sort of experimental drug to give yourself powers, you want to get the superpowers but you also don't want to come out a freak. But later the answer learns that he has one of the most powerful superpowers I have ever heard of. No matter what the situation, when he is faced with a conflict, his body will supply him with the powers to counter who or whatever he's fighting. So normally he's just a guy, but when the time calls for it, he can fly or create force fields or get super strength. But after a run in with Spidey that he wins, the character just kind of disappears and we don't see him that much. This guy fits on this list because of the wasted potential. Coming in at number 5 we have Kangaroo. I brought this up in the first video. If you're a villain or a hero, and you're choosing your power. You don't have to pick something lame. It seems like some of these villains focus way too much on the branding of their super persona rather than the powers. With Kangaroo, it seemed that the villain was set on theming themselves after Kangaroos rather than having a cool power. He has implants in his legs that allow him to jump very far and he's also a skilled boxer. Like not the worst combination of things, but when you're hell bent on taking out Spidey by stomping on him, you're probably going to lose a lot. There was this weird time in the 70s and 80s where Australia was this thing that the media was trying to push. It was foreign, it was interesting, no one really knew how to sell it. The closest that we got was Crocodile Dundee. But this villain seems like the big wigs at Marvel wanted to make an Australian themed villain because they thought kids would like it, rather than thinking of a good character first. Coming in at number 4 we have The Swarm. Have you guys seen that episode of South Park where they make a joke that the writers from Family Guy are just manatees in a tank and they all pull out three three random topics to base an episode around? Well that's what the swarm feels like. They were like German scientists, killer bees, purple cape. This dude is lame, not only because he's a swarm of bees that is being controlled by a dead scientist consciousness, but also because this dude gets beat by bug repellent. When him and Spidey face off, Spidey's able to beat him by spraying down his suit in bug spray and then the swarm literally can't get close enough to fight and has to run away. If your weakness can be purchased at Home Depot, then you're a pretty lame villain 
if you ask me. Coming in at number three, we have Grizzly. I like how in the Marvel Universe, if you're a bear enthusiast, you'll eventually get superpowers and become one of the lamest villains that Peter Parker has to fight on a semi regular basis. But if you're a bear enthusiast in real life, you just get eaten by bears. Two very different outcomes. Well, Maxwell Markham was just that a dude who loves bears, and get this, he was also a wrestler who hurt his fellow wrestlers too much, so he got kicked out of the league. We got a dude who loves bears, he used to be a wrestler. What's the third thing that's going to set this guy into the manatee formula? Oh, he was also given a bear suit that would hook him up with some superpowers. Where did he get this suit? Well, he got it from the Jackal, who's one of Spider Man's best villains, but that dude has a lot of dud moves. I feel like the Jackal just wakes up some days and is like, what if I gave a dude a bear suit so he thought he was a real villain and then Spider Man would have to deal with it? That would be jokes. Some of his plots sound more like pranks than actual schemes to cause mayhem. Coming in at number two, we have Hypno Hustler. Next, we have a villain that not only has a lame weakness, but their powers were used to such a small scale that doesn't really make any sense why this character was ever made. Hypno Hustler is Anthony Del Soen. And he has music that can take over your mind. His songs allow him to control people around him and then they do his bidding. But the thing is, if he hears his own music, he will also become hypnotized. He can't even handle his own groovy music, which seems strange. I've never heard of a hypnotist hypnotizing themselves. But when we first see Hypno Hustler, he's shaking people down for just their pocket change at a show. I feel like this guy should have had bigger dreams. If he got one of his songs on the radio, he could have taken over the world. And coming out the number one spot we have Humbug. Here's the thing, when you hear that there's a hero based off a spider, that's kinda cool because at least spiders are scary, they make web, they do some interesting things. But when you hear there's a villain that just has a general insect theme, you can throw that one in the trash. I really couldn't dislike this villain more. For one, he should be able to beat Spider Man because he's got a super suit that gives him skills that are on par with the web slinger. But this guy has the worst weakness of all a love for bugs. He loves bugs so much that Spider Man has been able to halt this guy from a life of crime by telling him he's going to smash some cockroaches. Like, dude, Give your head a shake. Coming in at number 10, we have Frogman. I mean, if you don't have any powers, you don't have to commit to a super lame animal. Frogman is Eugene Patilio. There was a time when he took his frog suit and he tried to take on some of the hardest hitting street level Marvel heroes. More than once did he come face to face with Spidey and every time he was taken into the dirt almost immediately. And it's not hard to figure out why the guy built a suit where the only power was how high he could jump. Like if you're going to get your powers from some sort of accident or you're born with them, then you don't have a choice. You have to stick with whatever your weird power is. That that's your life, but if you're building a power, then you can be whoever you want. Why would you choose frogs? There are so many other creatures you could go with. Like the falcon, even though he's not the coolest hero of all time, he's a million times cooler than the dude who hops around and tries to cause some havoc. On the bright side, Eugene's son eventually takes on the mantle of the frog suit and tries to be a hero, but on the downside, Eugene's son sucks at being a hero as much as his dad sucks at being a villain. So in the end, the family was doomed to be on the sidelines. I would like to see one of those what if comics where Frogman becomes the greatest hero of all time. Hey guys, if you like these videos and you want to see some more, make sure you hit that like button. Number nine, the Trapster. His name is Peter Petruski, and I can't believe how long he's been around. Marvel has him come back again and again, despite the fact that he's got no powers other than this weird paste gun. He invented a super adhesive liquid paste and loves using it for evil. He's redesigned his costume multiple times, always ridiculous and far too proud of himself, but he has definitely been around. He appears in multiple stories and has gone up against the likes of Daredevil, Fantastic Four, and of course Spider-Man. All with just a goo gun. He is hired by Red Skull at one point and even has a run in with Ghost Rider. His paste was once confused for Spider Man's webbing, and Trapster was furious to see Spidey getting credit in the newspaper for his crimes. Trapster is undeniably lame, but he's obviously got some fans because he's been around so long, so we'll leave him here at number nine. Lame, but not the worst. And coming in at number eight, we have Stegron the Dinosaur Man. Once again, if you get to pick your powers, maybe you should shoot a little higher than being a species that already went extinct. They already lost the battle with nature. You think they will be able to take down superheroes? Stegron was originally Dr. Vincent Stegron. He was a scientist who took a liking to the serum which turned Kurt Connors into 
to the lizard man and he decided he would up the ante a little bit. He mixed the formula with dinosaur DNA and then shot it all up inside his body and turned into a dinosaur human hybrid. He then went on to try and make a army of dinosaurs to try and take over the world but was taken down by a force he didn't expect. It was winter. Dinosaurs are cold blooded apparently so when winter came around they all went to sleep including Stegron. If you're picking your superpower you should go with something that can handle temperatures below 10 degrees Celsius. Unless you're in Florida or something. If you're down there you can build the biggest dinosaur army you want and the state would probably be fine with it. Number 7. Slide. This guy was a chemical engineer who created a chemical coating that eliminated all friction between that object and surfaces. He's like the opposite of Trapster. He invented the ultimate lubricant. Then this evil tycoon buys up the company that he works for and shuts down the lab. Slide, aka Jalome Beecher, was going to build his own company founded on the nonstick solution he invented, but no bank was willing to give him a loan. So he did what anybody would do and decides to rob the bank. He makes himself a costume out of this material and free from the clutches of friction is able to zip around skating on the ground up to 30 miles per hour and can't be stopped not by people's grabbing hands or even Spider-Man's sticky webbing. Now this isn't exactly the most lame villain but the idea of this slippery criminal sliding all over the place just doesn't really do it for me. Where's the stakes? Spidey could just wait for this guy to slip and fall off of a cliff or into oncoming traffic. Or they could just have him slip and slide right into a jail cell. I'll say one thing, the way that he zips all over the place in the comic panels looks like a lot of fun. Number 6, The Walrus. With big wet flippers and menacing tusks and the blood curdling cries of ARF ARF, it's easy to see how terrifying a walrus based supervillain could be. This guy is not. Hubert Carpenter was created when his uncle, a janitor, tried again and again to give Hubert powers. They exhausted the names of animals he could have the proportionate strength of all the way through the alphabet till they got to the letter W. He was totally stumped and then became inspired by a poster of the Beatles and becomes the walrus. He goes on a classic spree of mass destruction eventually seeing Beast lecturing at a university and decides to attack him to prove that he's the greatest product of modern science. Hilariously enough, it's actually Frogman who gets the credit for taking him down later and this really gets the blubber boiling. <laughs> Spider-Man can't help laughing when he meets this guy and winds up taking him down for the second time with just a tap of his finger. Coming in number 5 we have Typeface. You know what everyone loves? Signage! So why don't you make your persona based off that? I'm sure that will pull in a ton of people and you'll become one of the most famous super villains of all time. No way man, signage is super lame. Well Typeface also known as Gordon Thomas didn't think so and he had a pretty good foundation. He was a Vietnam war vet who was skilled in hand to hand combat, military tactics and all sorts of weapons. He even beat Spider-Man man in their first encounter. If this guy changed his theme to anything other than signage, he probably would have been pretty cool. But the reason that he did this was because when Thomas came back from war, his life fell apart and he ended up getting a job at a sign shop and it was the only time in his life where he ever felt happy. When the place was bought out, he lost his job and this was his inspiration to become a villain. Luckily, he eventually switched sides and becomes a hero. If you're going to get an F on your character, you might as well be on the side of good. Number 4. The Spot This guy is something else. Some people think his powers are pretty cool and others hate him, but he definitely belongs on this list. Spider-Man himself bursts into tears laughing upon meeting this guy and <laughs> looking like a Dalmatian, it's pretty easy to see why. He's all white, covered in black spots that function as two-way portals. That's pretty much his main thing. He takes the spots and he chucks them around and uses them like portals like this is Looney Tunes, messing around with Spider-Man and even making him punch himself in the face. If this guy doesn't sound lame enough already, the more portals that he throws around, the less spots that he has on his body, making himself more vulnerable. He got these powers after being exposed to the spotted dimension, and the spots can even be suspended in mid-air. It's honestly a pretty cool concept, but the villain himself is just too lame to make it work for me. And coming in number 3 we have Spider Side. Like genocide but performed by a spider. Yeah, that is not the best writing I've ever heard of in my life. Spider Side was birthed out of the Clone Saga which is considered one of the worst sagas in comic history. So any villain to come out of it is probably never going to see the light of day again unless they're used as a joke. Spider Side is a clone of Spider-Man that has the ability to regenerate from what seems to be any accident. 
accident. He was convinced at first that he was the real Peter Parker, but then he found out that he was just a freak. Such is the plight of most clones. When you read his character on paper, it sounds super cool. He has the powers of Spider-Man with some of the most deadly features of the Terminator, but the character was used in such a horrible fashion that it became a laughing stock before it ever got its time to shine. Maybe in the future we'll see someone use this character to its full ability. Number two, Plant Man. In Strange Tales number 113 from 1963, we meet the mysterious Plant Man. This gardener turned professional criminal was born in London and orphaned at a young age. When he left the orphanage, he became lab assistant to a well-known botanist who was studying the low-level mental activity of plant life. Unfortunately, this guy fired him for focusing too much on this invention he was making and not gardening for him. One day, lightning strikes his plant ray gun that he's been working on, and it becomes imbued with the power to control and animate plant life. Ooh. So he then makes a disguise and sets out to get his revenge for being fired by framing his boss for robbery. The plant life isn't the only thing with low-level mental activity, as this guy made from leaves somehow thinks that he can take on the Human Torch. He is later quickly defeated and his ray gun is destroyed, uh, although I'm sad to say he does appear again in 2002. And coming at the number one spot, we have Big Wheel. This villain's theme is a massive wheel that he rides around and it has guns on it. Reading some of these is like watching a breakdown of a group of YouTubers trying to find out what they need to do so they can set their channel apart from everyone else. Like maybe if I was the wheel guy, then people would like my content. Well, Big Wheel is just an ordinary guy until the tinkerer gave him something that was probably a prank, a massive wheel that could ride around and had guns on it. You think something like that would be extremely hard to control? and you would be right. Big Wheel would die when he lost control of his massive wheel car thing and fell into a river and drowned. Here's a lesson for any future villain. If you want to pick a gimmick that is going to set you apart from the rest, before you make a hard decision and invest in a giant wheel that will get you killed and make you look like a Fool, you should probably hire a think tank to come up with a better idea. Like I said earlier on in this list, you can pick whatever power you want when you're building it from scratch. So why go with wheels? Yeah.